Finding herself in dire circumstances after the death of powerful Roman Emperor Mark Antony, Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, committed suicide at the age of 39 and with her died the Egyptian civilization that had been around for roughly 3,000 years. Egypt would now be a Roman province and Cleopatra would transition from a living legend to a dead one. Cleopatra, actually Cleopatra VII, her full name being Cleopatra VII Thea Philopator, or Cleopatra the father-loving goddess, was the last in a long line of Greek Ptolemaic rulers given the kingdom of Egypt by none other than Alexander the Great, and she packed a whole hell of a lot of life into less than four decades on the earth. She bore famed Roman leader Julius Caesar a son who, had certain key events gone differently during her lifetime, could have ended up ruling both Rome and Egypt. She had two additional sons and a daughter with Mark Antony, and then she fought together with Antony to rule both Egypt and Rome. Cleopatra once personally led several dozen Egyptian warships into naval battle. Renowned for her beauty, her political guile, and toughness were actually her most formidable assets. She would live to become the first non-Roman citizen to be featured on a Roman coin. She would rule Egypt for 22 years, lose her kingdom, regain it, nearly lose it again, amass an empire, and then lose it all. The month of August is based on when Cleopatra died. That's when you know you've reached some sort of immortality, when the placement of one of our 12 months is based on your death. The, ferment, the first Roman emperor, Augustus, who gave us the name of that month, founded his reign on her defeat. When he had the chance to have a month named in his honor, instead of choosing September, the month of his birth, he chose the eighth month, when Cleopatra died, so it could be a yearly reminder of her defeat. Shakespeare would reintroduce Cleopatra to the world of more than just historians when he wrote Antony and Cleopatra, a five-act tragedy in 1606-1607, and we've been wondering about Cleopatra's life ever since. And we dig in deep today on the fascinating and frankly super weird tale of this strange, epic, and legendary life, the life of Cleopatra, a woman who came from perhaps the most dysfunctional, like the most dysfunctional family in the history of the world today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay. Felt like it opened, uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, too aggressively uh, this this past week. So easing, easing the volume pedal to, uh, to to start the show today. Trying to Trying to keep it in. Maybe had a bit too much uh, MCT powder last week. I may be addicted. I've had quite a bit this morning. I'm trying to, trying to hold in the fire. Thanks to everyone who got the uh, A-Hole Air Banjo Academy tees last week. They, they sold out shortly after the DB Cooper episode dropped. Space Lizards gobbled them up. A lot of, lot of Air Banjo being played around the world right now. It might be at record levels right now. It, it's the rare instrument that is generally far more fun to play than to hear but it's so fun to play. Bang, dum, dang, 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 Fucking adrenaline right into my soul. Um, Dan Cummins, the master sucker. Chikatilo's wrestling partner. Chicken Joe's top chicken. The guy who puts the ee and Woody's wee. And you're listening to Time Suck. Hello, Cult of Curious. Hail Nimrod, Lucifina, Bojangles. Knowledge, mischief, and strength. Uh, thanks to those who came to the TED Talk and to those who also swung by the Suck Dungeon. I'm recording this in advance. So I'm hoping, throwing some positive energy into the TED Talk having gone well. Currently very nervous uh, about giving a presentation. It's a lot more about passion and thought uh, provocation than it is about laughter and absurdity. Uh, my safe places and with less than 24 hours to go, or right around 24 hours to go as I'm recording this, don't have it memorized yet. <laughs> oh, flop sweat. Happy birthday uh, to my uh, uh, sweet little meat sack babies, Kyler Monroe. Turned 11 and 13 this past week. My God, man, they grow up fast. Uh, I'm so proud of these wonderful little people. They're becoming I'm grateful to be able to witness the development of their big, beautiful lives. Uh, Dad loves the shit out of you two both. And thanks again to the Space Lizard Patreons for allowing us to donate $1,400 this month to the Pew Research Center. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for growing the show. And also, I have some important questions for you. Um, and, and yeah, and you can, you can, I think we'll have the link for that, uh, the Pew Foundation, journalism.org in the episode description. And, but now, important questions. Do you have a baby? Do you know of a baby or upcoming baby that may or does suck? Another, another small run of a new product this week that, uh, people have been asking about for over a year is in the store. A time suck onesie. Why not? We got a onesie now for baby suckers. Not even joking. 
the limited run of the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy shirts, uh, they sold out last Tuesday, but now we have a few onesies in the store. The first time suck, give me that sweet suck, 100% cotton, 200% baby butt onesie. Even babies know that some of the softest material on earth is a baby's butt. And that's why we're making this onesie out of nothing but cotton and also nothing but domestic baby butt. Don't think about it too hard or it gets very sad. It gets so very sad. Uh, just focus on your baby wearing somebody else's baby's soft ass baby butt. Don't focus on that either. That's, that's sadder. If you focus on the material, you start thinking about a lot of things that have happened to babies. Hey, just focus on your sweet little one wearing some sweet suck while you listen to some sweet suck. That's, that's positive. That feels right. Six months, 12 months, 18 months size is available while supplies last. Uh, also, if you're not familiar with my stand-up, I currently have a special on Amazon Prime called Don't Wake the Bear, and I've created a Spotify Best of Playlist. I don't know why it took me so long to do this. It took like five, five minutes to do. I created a Spotify Best of Playlist so you can sample for free some of my favorite tra uh, tracks, 15 in all in this playlist uh, from the six albums I have on Spotify. It's just called The Best of Dan Cummins Stand-Up, and there's a link to that in today's episode description. Uh, and if you've heard all that and you want to hear some more, come to the Happy Murder Tour. Right? Here's some hateful aggression that somehow makes you feel good about life. Check dancummins.tv to see so many 2019 tour dates all over the place. This week I hit the Comedy Connection in Providence, Rhode Island. One night only, Wednesday, January 10th. Rest of the week I'm at the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Thursday, January 17th through Saturday, January 19th. Then on Sunday, Upstate, New York. Funny Vote in Albany. One night only, January 20th. And the next week, New Jersey, uh, New Brunswick. New Jersey Stress Factory, Thursday, January 24th through Saturday, January 26th. Then I'm back home. Then I bounce out to Madison, Wisconsin, stand-up shows, and the first live time suck of 2019. Talking about the Ant Hill Kids. The Ant Hill Cult at the live suck this year. Holy shit. Do you want your legs broken with a sledgehammer? Or do you want to go to hell? That's the, that's the, that's the kind of uh, uh, insane choices that uh, barbaric Canadian cult leader, Rock Terrio, would tell followers, would give followers in the late 70s. He personally brutalized his followers in, in a way uh, few cult leaders I've ever read about have done. He, he was the ultimate fucked up cult leader. Physically and sexually abused his own children well, until welfare authorities uh, took his kids away. And then, uh, and then he just found some other people to torment. Found these anthill kids, found some followers. When, when their pappy would become angry, he would take on the role of twisted surgeon. The offending party would be held down fully conscious while other followers... And Terrio would go to work on them with whatever horrible instruments were available. Kitchen utensils, pliers, a blowtorch, whatever inflicted the most pain and fear. Followers lost limbs, teeth, fingers, and toes to this maniac. And I'm going to enjoy insulting and mocking that deranged piece of shit and trying to wrap my head around how he got so many people to follow him at shows across America this year. So there's that. And that's it. And now we can get into the, the real stuff. And now we can get into today's less deranged, maybe. Maybe less strange. Definitely no less interesting suck on Cleopatra. I, I enjoyed sucking on her. I really did. I sucked her hard this week. I just I got down on my knees and I sucked some Cleopatra and uh, I'm done now. For 10 generations, Cleopatra's family ruled Egypt as the last of its pharaohs. But her family wasn't actually Egyptian. The Ptolemies were in fact uh, Macedonian Greek. So Cleopatra, although she ruled Egypt, was approximately as Egyptian as Elizabeth Taylor, the American actress who famously played Cleopatra in 1963, a 1963 film famous for being so expensive that it lost money despite being the highest grossing film at the box office that year. Uh, that movie is also over four hours long. I made it through two and then I tapped out. Uh, we'll be a little quicker. We'll pack in a lot more what the fuck uh, with an exploration of Cleopatra's weird life today. Also, I think it's important to note that most of what we know about Cleopatra is what has been written by the famous Roman historian, uh, did I say Roman? Roman historian, Plutarch, who was born 76 years after she died. So very little of this is firsthand information. That's just kind of the way it works with a lot of stories back then. So let's hope that son of a bitch uh, got the story right. <clears throat> Excuse me. If he didn't, uh, he at least wove a whopper of a tale. Uh, before we dive into Cleopatra's life, let's talk about the times she lived in. Talking about the first century BCE. Uh, when she was born, the Roman Republic was nearing the end of its 500-year run following the overthrow of the Roman Kingdom when it was a monarchy. The Republic became one of the most successful expressions of democracy in ancient times as Rome rose from a powerful city to a world power under the leadership of the Senate. The tale of Cleopatra is interwoven with the fall of the Republic, two of her lovers. The only two fathers of her children would play major roles in the end of the Republic, especially Julius Caesar. 
In the Middle East, shortly after the fall of the Egyptian Empire, Jesus Christ will be born. Most scholars place in his birth between uh, 6 BCE and 1 CE. A new major world religion, a religion that centuries later would become a powerful guiding force in the Roman Empire, would obviously soon follow. In the East, the Han Dynasty reigned supreme. Uh, the Han Dynasty would actually rule over a larger area of land, you know, around modern-day China, than Rome at its height. In Mesoamerica, the Mayans ran a kingdom of city-states. There were a ton of other smaller kingdoms in Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe, and of course other indigenous people living around the globe. In the West and the Middle East, uh, Europe and North Africa, no empires were bigger than Rome in Egypt. And during the last years of her life and then following her death, Rome would amass an empire unlike anything the Western world uh, had seen since the days of Alexander the Great. And the days of Alexander the Great is actually where Cleopatra's story really begins. So let's jump back to the 4th century BCE in today's epic Time Suck timeline. But first, first, a word from uh, one of today's sponsors. Time Suck is brought to you by longtime supporter of the Suck, uh, a company I'm a huge fan of, Lisa Mattresses. Resolve to rest this new year. Kick 2019 off with some sweet, sweet sleep. Put some, put some power naps on the calendar with a Lisa mattress. A quality night's sleep helps you recover from distractions faster, prevent burnouts, make better decisions, improve your memory, overall make fewer mistakes. Uh, I, like, I like less mistakes. I'm going to say I'm pro less mistake. Uh, to design a better mattress, Lisa at leveraged over 30 years of experience, hundreds of hours of testing to develop the perfect mattress for all body shapes and sleeping styles. Also, do you remember that along with the Arbor Day Foundation, Lisa plants one tree for every mattress they sell? I like that. I like trees. I'm also pro tree. A lot of people don't know about that about me. I'm pro tree. I like, I like a world with trees. Uh, Lindsay and I, we love our Lisa mattress. Uh, so do fur babies and bed mates and bed monsters. Uh, whether I want them to be in bed or not, Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell. I like a firm mattress with that memory foam, you know, type of give on top. I'm not going to sink into it. Not going to have to perform acrobatics to hurl my ass out of its depths when I get out in the morn. I uh, also don't like feeling like I'm jumping into some concrete when I get into bed. At least it nails the magical middle of the soft and firm line. So start 2009, uh, 2019. I went back in time. That would be weird if I was like, all right, so start 2009. Get in your, get in your time machine. No. Start 2019 well rested. Get $160 off a Lisa mattress at lisa.com slash timesuck when you use the promo code timesuck at checkout. That's l e e s a dot com slash timesuck, promo code timesuck. Link in the episode description or just push that little uh, Lisa sponsor button on our handy little timesuck app. Now it is time for the timesuck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Three twenty three BCE. In three twenty three BCE, Alexander the Great. I've heard of him. Alexander the Third of uh, Macedon died in Babylon at the age of thirty two, possibly poisoned by whom we will never know. One of his companions, a general and historian, was Ptolemy. Ptolemy the First. Ptolemy Soter. He'd been a close companion of Alexander since childhood and possibly was even his half-brother. Ptolemy's father may have been Alexander's father, Philip II. Ptolemy served with Alexander since the very beginning of his famed military uh, conquest campaigns, was among seven military leaders who were also Alexander's personal bodyguards. He played principal roles and commanded troops in battles in Afghanistan, India, Persia, and more. And when Alexander died, he and other top generals, uh, talking about Ptolemy, Ptolemy and other top generals, fought for portions of Alexander's empire. Ptolemy, in an initial gr agreement with other leaders, was made satrap or governor of Egypt. Alexander had conquered e Egypt in 332 BCE, and he established a city there that still bears his name, Alexandria. He conquered it, but he didn't necessarily make it Greek, uh, which is why the Egyptian kingdom would live on under Ptolemy. E Egypt would, would continue to be dominated by Egyptian culture. Ptolemy took Egypt from a line of Persian pharaohs. Before him, uh, he respected Egyptian religion and culture, traveled to the Oracle of Amun, was declared to be the son of Amun. At the time, Amun was the chief deity of Egypt. Uh, he left a fellow Greek, Cleomenes, to run this new province while he left to conquer more lands the following year. Uh, Cleomenes, there we go. You know, I, I did the most, <laughs> the most phonetic checks I've ever done for an episode. So, uh, probably not for you Egypt lovers. I may not be batting 100%, but close. I, I feel pretty confident about a, a lot of these things. 321 BC, fellow Greek general of Alexander's, Perdiccas, <laughs> I like that name. Perdiccas fought for, that's a powerful name. Uh, who's your dad? Perdiccas, motherfucker! All right, all right, I get it, 
Okay. Uh, 321, a fellow Greek uh, general of Alexander's predicus fought for control of Alexander's empire, took soldiers into Egypt to take the province from Ptolemy. When the invasion floundered and Ptolemy fought him off, uh, this guy's soldiers turned on him and killed him. Oh, man. Perdiccas. Ah, he died a hard death. I just said, I didn't even mean that pun, but I'm going to stand by. After defending his province uh, from Perdiccas, a man whose uh, name, again, does not translate, you know, tra has an interesting translation into today's English. Ptolemy fought the rulers of other successor states led by his former fellow generals under Alexander in what's known as the Wars of the Diachi or the Wars of the Successors. First... He battled Scrotomachus in Cyprus, a feared leader known to be especially sensitive towards being touched, who seemed to droop down a bit on the left side. A man terribly suited to fighting in cold weather. Soon after, after defeating Scrotomachus, he waged war on Clitorchus in Armenia. Now, Clitorchus was a small general who could be really tricky to find. The key to defeating him was to bring him out into the open sea, get him wet, and constantly and consistently attack him. Uh, Clitorchus, uh, Clitorchus lost focus when he was wet and overstimulated. Finally, Ptolemy uh, battled two generals in one day when he fought both uh, Bigicus Titicus and Longicus Pinicus uh, in present-day Libya. It was crazy because they kept doing this weird maneuver where Bigicus Titicus would squeeze two flanks together, just kind of push two flanks together uh, real tight, and then Longicus Pinicus would thrust back and forth between Betweenicus Themicus, and I'm done. <laughs> I'm done, Icus. Sorry, Icus, about it, about that, Icus. Uh, back to real history, Icus. That was way, that was way Icus to, to Icus Funicus for me, Icus. In 305 BCE, back to reality, Ptolemy took the title of king in the land he already governed. He became uh, Pharaoh. He became known as Ptolemy, uh, like I said, for the Soter, Ptolemy the Savior. Ptolemy would found the famed Library of Alexandria, one of the largest and most famous libraries in the ancient world. This library at its height is estimated to have contained 400,000 uh, papyrus scrolls, yeah, that word still messes with me. I see paper, pap paprikas, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, 400,000 uh, papyrus scrolls. Ptolemy the first was the first of the Ptolemaic rulers of ancient Egypt. Cleopatra would be the last. The last to actually rule. Her son would technically be the last. The last uh, Egyptian pharaohs. Their, their family would, would rule Egypt often, often on, uh, like, uh, include, or sorry, would rule Egypt and often on the lands around Egypt. For, yeah, for nearly 300 years. And the rule would remain in the family in a super creepy way. All the male rulers of the dynasty would take the name Ptolemy, while princesses and queens preferred the names Cleopatra, uh, Arsinoe, and Berenice, which uh, the last one means bringer of victory. Pretty dope name. But onto, the, but onto the creepy stuff. Here's the creepy keeping it in the family stuff. It's not about names. The Ptolemaic kings adopted the Egyptian custom of marrying their sisters. Blech. So many of the kings ruled jointly with their spouses, who were also of the royal house. This custom made Ptolemaic politics confusing and, and, and literally incestuous. Um, the later, the, and also the later Ptolemies, like towards Cleopatra's day, became increasingly feeble. Of course they did. It was like they have a very, very, very narrow skinny tree. It has so few branches. The only Ptolemaic queens to officially rule on their own were Berenice, uh, Berenice III and Berenice IV. Uh, Cleopatra V did co-rule, but it was another with another female, uh, Berenice IV. Cleopatra VII, our Cleopatra, officially co-ruled with Ptolemy the Thirteenth, Ptolemy the Fourteenth, and Ptolemy the Fifteenth. But effectively, Cleopatra VII did rule Egypt alone. The early Ptolemies did not disturb the religion or other customs of the Egyptians. They they built magnificent new temples for the Egyptian gods and soon adopted the outward display of the pharaohs of old. Uh, nevertheless, the Greek remained a privileged minority in Ptolemaic Egypt. They lived under Greek law, uh, received Greek education, were tried in Greek courts, were citizens of Greek cities. Very interesting hybrid culture. But enough about that. Let's talk more about incest. Uh, according to one historian and Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, Stacy Schiff, author of 2010's Cleopatra, A Life, Ptolemy's, the la uh, oh, sorry, sorry, 2010's Cleopatra, A Life. Uh, she says, Ptolemy's, the last dynasty of Greek Egypt made Caligula look like a pouty teen. The first three monarchs in the dynasty were capable, vigorous sorts. But from the fourth to the fourteenth monarch, things got very nasty indeed. The Ptolemies didn't really live family life as we understand it. Rather, they lived kind of a domestic safari in which you tried to kill as many of your close relatives as you were able, preferably in a, as painful and public a way as possible. It's very Game of Thrones. Cleopatra VII's full name was Cleopatra VII Philopator, uh, which means father lover. Many of the Ptolemies would be known as father lover or mother lover, which is darkly hilarious to me because they killed their parents all the fucking time. 
and other relatives. A lot of incest, a lot of murder. This is one of the most dysfunctional, if not the most dysfunctional family of all time. You will feel so much better about your family tree and your family in general after hearing all of this. HBO needs to do a series on this kingdom. So much murder, so much incest. Uh, all surrounded by decadent wealth and set in the splendor of ancient Egypt's most incredible city. And, and the whole everyone having the same names thing, so confusing, uh, makes it hard to explain who is killing whom. Like Ptolemy killed Cleopatra, his wife, sister, and niece would be a true sentence in certain uh, Ptolemaic palace plots. So much incest and murder. Not given dates for the following relationships and killings because there's just too many and it slows down the action. Uh, so here we go. This was, this was uh, just like a lot of like, when I was researching this, I was like, what? Ptolemy IV, great-grandson of Ptolemy I, murdered his mother, who had killed her husband, who was having a love affair with her mother. Married sister, Arsinoe, the third, who was murdered immediately after Ptolemy IV's death. And we're just getting started. Ptolemy V had his mother's murderers ripped apart by a mob. Had an angry mob rip apart a uh, uh, family, family member. Ptolemy VI fought his own brother for the throne, then married his sister, Cleopatra II. Ptolemy VII was murdered by his uncle uh, <laughs> at a wedding feast, or he may have been murdered by his own father, uh, Ptolemy VI. Ptolemy VII was the great enemy of Ptolemy VI. Uh, and probable murderer of Ptolemy VII. He also married Cleopatra II, then began an affair with Cleopatra's daughter, Cleopatra III. Fuck! So many of the same names, so much murder. Uh, this is a family that makes the Lannisters on Game of Thrones look like the, look like the Cleavers from Leave it to Beaver. Uh, or the Andersons from another show probably only 5% of you have ever watched or heard of. Father knows best. Uh, Ptolemy VII had his son dismembered and the peace is sent to his mother, uh, to the, the mother, excuse me, Cleopatra II, his sister wife, his daughter, Tryphena, had her own sister, Cleopatra IV, murdered, for which she was in turn killed by that Cleopatra's husband. Ptolemy IX apparently tried to kill his mother, Cleopatra III, uh, married uh, first one and then another sister, both called Cleopatra, had married to two different women, both named Cleopatra, both his sisters. This shit is ridiculous. Ptolemy IX fought his brother, Ptolemy X, for the throne, their mother, Cleopatra III, changing sides frequently. Ptolemy X killed his mother, Cleopatra III, when she was not on his side. He married the daughter of Ptolemy IV, Berenice III, his niece. Uh, Ptolemy XI also married Berenice III, who was either his uh, 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 sister or mother. Uh, even historians get confused, but, but had her killed after 19 days, so much for the bringer of victory name. Ptolemy XI excuse me, was then lynched and, and killed by an angry mob. Ptolemy XII driven from Egypt by his daughter, Berenice IV. Berenice IV rules briefly before she probably has uh, uh, had her sister killed. She certainly had her husband strangled, who strangely was not a family member. She was then beheaded by someone who was a family member. Her father told me the 12th. <sighs> she at least brought some victory before she lost her head. Of the 15 or so family marriages in this dynasty, at least 10 were full brother-sister unions. Two other Ptolemies married nieces or cousins. The practice resulted in no physical deformities that have been uh, you know, mentioned by historians, but did deliver uh, yeah, a, a seriously skinny-ass family tree. If Cleopatra's parents were full siblings, as they likely were, that means she had one set of grandparents. Weird. So weird. It's funny that someone who came from that much incest, like a preposterous amount of incest, ended up becoming known as having legendary beauty. Which may just be legend, by the way. Many historians seem to think the real uh, uh, Cleo, uh, like like the real powers, as far as uh, Cleopatra's seductive and charismatic powers, came a lot more from her intellig intelligence than her physical beauty. But also weird to think that somebody that intelligent would come from enough uh, inbreeding to spook a pining, right? Well, look at here now. I got some pick. Touch this pick. I did lick out of Cleopatra's beard. Well, look at here now. I killed my brother. Made a butt baby with a sister and a mine. But got mauled by a baboon cop. Yeah, yeah. Hot folk don't mix with no dog folk. A lot of callbacks there. New Jersey Devil Suck callback. Pinkerton callback. Hatfield McCoy callback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, new listener. Okay. So that. So I just wanted to get that out there. If I missed, uh, if I missed a number, got the number wrong behind it. I think you'll understand. It is just it's so weird to have so much murder, so much incest, and then all the same fucking names. Ugh. Okay, so Cleopatra VII, our Cleopatra today, was born in or around 69 BCE, probably 69 BCE. Cleopatra's father was Ptolemy XII, the one driven from Egypt by, his, by uh, her older sister, his daughter Berenice, 
Uh, her father is generally described as a weak, self-indulgent man, a drunkard, and a music lover. So, fun dad! Ha <laughs> Yeah! Uh, historians aren't entirely sure who her mother was, most likely either Cleopatra the Sixth or Cleopatra the Fifth. Again, so confusing with all the names. Uh, can you imagine being born into that level of dysfunction? Over a century of your family constantly murdering each other. Your very, very, very close family. Uh, just so much brother dick and sister puss in your family tree. Cleopatra known for being extremely intelligent, so from an early age, she had to have known that the greatest odds of a violent death came from within her family. Cleopatra had two sisters, Berenice the fourth and Arsinoe the, uh, the fourth as well, and two brothers, Ptolemy the thirteenth and Ptolemy the fourteenth. Blah. Cleopatra's father began his reign in 80 BCE, despite Ptolemy's own father and previous pharaoh leaving the Egyptian throne to Rome in his will. Luckily for the family, the Roman Senate had no interest in fighting to acquire Egypt and make it a Roman territory at that time. In 58 BCE, the Roman Republic did uh, take control of Cyprus, causing its ruler, Ptolemy XII's brother, to commit suicide. Uh, Ptolemy XII then failed to do anything about the Roman conquest of Cyprus, thereby inciting the Egyptian population to start a rebellion against him, as Cyprus was an important ally of the Egyptians. Cyprus had long supplied the Egyptian kingdom with important timber and copper. Egyptians were all already aggravated by heavy taxes recently enacted to pay the Romans a tribute so they wouldn't invade Egypt, which created a substantial increase in the cost of living. His daughter, Berenice IV, saw this unrest as a chance to rule herself. Being a Ptolemy, she's like, when do I get to kill my fucking dad? She conspired to turn the public against her father to become his successor, which she did. And then he fled to Rome with his daughter, Cleopatra VII, our Cleopatra, and possibly other siblings. Berenice ruled as co-regent with her mother or sister. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I, I'm going to say mother. Uh, mother, because this uh, other Cleopatra is not mentioned in the siblings. So she, let's say she ruled with her mother. A year after Ptolemy the Twelfth's exile, uh, Berenice uh, ruled alone over Alexandria from 57 to 56 BCE. In Rome, an old ally, heralded Roman military commander Pompey, housed the exile king and his daughter, our Cleopatra, and argued on behalf of Ptolemy's restoration in the Senate, restoration to the, to the head of uh, Egypt. Roman creditors would not get the return on previous loans that they, they had made to the Egyptian king without his restoration to power so he could make some money again. Most things in you know, history, just in life in general, motivated by money in one way or another. 57 BCE, there was enormous pressure on the Senate from the Roman public to restore Ptolemy. However, Rome did not wish to invade Egypt to restore the kings and some ancient prophecies. I should say they were hesitant to invade Egypt because there were these ancient pro prophecies known as the Sibylline Books. And in these, it stated that if an Egyptian king asked for help and Rome proceeded with military intervention, great dangers and difficulties would occur. On 55 BCE, Ptolemy and his daughter Cleopatra and whatever other family members happened to be with him sailed back to Egypt from Rome. Ptolemy paid a Roman general, an ally of Pompey, uh, Aulus Gabinus, 10,000 talents to take back Egypt for him, which he did. And then Ptolemy had his daughter and his daughter's court executed. Man, can you, can you imagine sentencing your own daughter to death? Uh, I'm not sure what Monroe could do to have me warrant executing her. <laughs> Like, like, even if she for sure, like, for sure tried to have me killed, I don't think I could kill her. Just, Monroe! I found out about the assassination plot, and I gotta say, oh, I am super disappointed in you, young lady. Really makes my heart heavy that you paid some people to kill me. Really upsets me. You're, yeah, you are in big trouble. I'm gonna take away your iPad. I know, huh? I know you just got it, but stop crying, because you tried to kill me. And, let's... Okay, calm down. Listen, I'm not taking away forever. I, but if you're not, if you, if you do this again, if you do this again, I, I, I won't just take it away for a month. I'll take it away forever. If you try to kill me again, oh boy, you're not getting your iPad back. I won't, fick, I won't fuck around if you try to kill me twice. Uh, one Egyptian talent, by the way, was 27 kilograms or 60 pounds worth of silver. The word talent, uh, now used to describe skill, actually gets traced back to this early monetary measurement. So Ptolemy paid a Roman general with 600,000 pounds of silver to take back Egypt. Silver's price, when I checked last week, uh, was just over $252 a pound. So in today's money, he paid over 151 million U.S. dollars to get back Egypt. I gotta say, doesn't sound like a bad price for a kingdom. Seems like a good deal to get your kingdom back for 150 mil. 
Uh, shortly after regaining power, Ptolemy fell ill, and in his will he named his son and daughter Ptolemy the Thirteenth, Cleopatra the Seventh, to be co-regents to rule upon his death, as was customary in their dynasty. A lot of co-rulers, and then he died in 51 BCE. So Cleopatra now in charge of Egypt. Cleopatra and her brother inherit an empire in shambles. Their father was never able to fully back, uh, fully pay back Roman creditors near the end of Ptolemy's reign. Uh, the value of Egyptian coinage dropped to about 50% of its previous value uh, at the beginning of his reign because of the uh, uh, Roman loss of faith in his Egyptian economy. Cleopatra is only 18, her brother's only 10, so really she is now the sole ruler of Egypt. In a solemn ceremony before Egypt's high priest, Cleopatra and her brother ascend to the throne, probably in, in late, uh, late in the spring of 51 BCE. She applies herself more than any of her predecessors. She was allegedly the first and only Ptolemy to bother to learn the language of Egypt, the language of the seven million people over whom she ruled. That's unbelievable to me. The arrogance of her ancestors. They've been in Egypt for three centuries. And they're like, ah, fucking, ah, I don't want to learn the language. It's common folk, Pfft, ugh, peasants. As is custom in her family, she and her brother are married. Gross. Uh, not only is he her brother, but you know, he's 10. Uh, hoping. Guessing they did not consummate their relationship. Ah, it's a very disturbing wedding night to think about. Uh, young Ptolemy's guardians conspire against Cleopatra. Even though he's 10, he's not too young to try and kill his sister. He's a Ptolemy. It's in their blood. Uh, they conspire against Cleopatra. And, and, and they don't kill her, but they do banish her. They banish her from Alexandria in 49 BCE. So now she has to go to Syria. And she sulks out there and plots her way uh, as far as how to get back and rule Egypt. She's 21. She's an orphan. She's in, uh, in, in, in living in exile now. While in exile, the Roman Republic falls into civil war, a civil war that will end the Republic eventually. The two sides of this war were led on one side by the great general Pompey, also known as Pompey the Great. I, I told you he was great. Uh, the conquering friend of her father, who she stayed with in Rome, the man who helped restore her father to power in Egypt, and by another famous military general and conqueror on the other side, Julius Caesar, the man she would later have a famous love affair with, a man she would bear a son. The two men were once allies and both decorated veterans. Caesar had conquered much of what is now France. Pompey had conquered much of what is now Turkey and both wanted Rome all to themselves. By the summer of 48 BCE, Julius Caesar was winning the war. He, uh, he dealt Pompey a crushing defeat in ancient Greece. Pompey had fled to Egypt only to be stabbed upon landing on the coast of Egypt and decapitated. Uh, de what? And, and de what? Decapitated. He was, listen, you guys, you think that was a flub. He didn't have his head cut off. He was, as I said, decapitated, which means it doesn't mean anything. He was decapitated. He had his head cut off uh, by Egyptian uh, forces loyal to Cleopatra's brother. Caesar summons Cleopatra back to court in Alexandria, but young Ptolemy the 13th doesn't want her to return, refuses to allow her back to Egypt. So Cleopatra decides to take a huge risk, sneak back into Egypt, to ingratiate herself with the new master of the Roman world. Maybe he could help her restore, you know, uh, restore her to power, overthrow her brother, you know, help her like Pompey had helped her father. And the Roman historian Plutarch tells us quite a tale of how she makes it into the royal palace. He tells us that a loyal Sicilian confidant of hers named Apollodorus sneaks her down the Nile River in a basket. Apollodorus silently maneuvered a tiny two-oared boat into Alexandria's eastern harbor and under the palace wall just after dusk. At some point before Apollodorus docks his boat, Cleopatra crawls into an oversized sack of either hemp or leather in which she arranges herself lengthwise. Apollodorus rolls up this bundle, you know, secures it with a leather co a cord, and throws Cleopatra in this bundle over his shoulder. Then just walks, you know, carries Cleopatra through the palace, directly into Caesar's sleeping quarters, rooms that used to belong to her. Yeah, take that little husband, bro. Take that, husband, bro. Try and kick me out now, you weasley little backstabbing bastard. I'm back in the palace with the most important man in Rome, and I have three distinct advantages over you. I'm smarter than you. I'm sexy as hell. As hell. Hail Lucifina, and I have what uh, has historically been found to be one of the world's greatest assets, a 21-year-old vagina. 53-year-old uh, Caesar was intrigued by young Cleopatra. Of course he was. A woman 32 years his junior, scandalous age difference for some families, but since he wasn't her uncle or brother or cousin brother, pretty tame for the Ptolemies. Uh, when young Ptolemy discovers that his sister was with Caesar, he reacts much like you would suspect a 13-year-old inbred petulant ruler would. He storms out and throws a full-fledged temper tantrum hissy fit in the street, bawling in the street. Uh, it doesn't say anywhere that he literally threw himself down the street and bawled like a baby, but that's how I interpret temper tantrum, so I'm going to think that happened. When he's done, Caesar proposed a reconciliation between Cleopatra and Ptolemy on the condition that she should rule as, as his colleague in the kingdom. 
And then Ptolemy starts bawling again. This time it does say, like, he just, he cried. So he ran up crying. <laughs> and some of Caesar's men have to go find him. All right, stop, stop crying again. Return him to the palace. Uh, and then they place him under house arrest until Caesar can decide, you know, uh, what needs to be done. Caesar examined their father's will and reminded both Cleopatra and young Ptolemy that their father had intended them to rule together. And then to show them he was a, he was a good dude, he gave the island of Cyprus to two of, uh, of the other siblings, 17-year-old Arsinoe, 12-year-old Ptolemy the Fourteenth. Again, so confusing. Two brothers, both named Ptolemy. But the dad named Ptolemy with grandpa named Ptolemy. Fucking Ptolemy. Uh, only Cleopatra is interested in the offer. Ptolemy and his advisors hated it so much they plot to have Caesar poisoned. Uh, they plot to have Cleopatra's sister, sister Arsinoe... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Cleop uh, uh, Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoe, she decides she wants a lot more than Cyprus. She also wants to rule Egypt. So she conspires with the head of the Egyptian army, uh, Achilles, one of the men who had killed Pompey, she made it known to the other Alexandrians that she should lead because she was not enthralled by a Roman for foreigner. Uh, the public rallies behind her. So soon, Ptolemy is plotting to kill Caesar inside the palace. And then another sibling, Arsinoe, is, is leading a revolt outside the palace walls trying to kill Caesar. Uh, both of them, you know, trying to kill Cleopatra, I'm sure, as well. Fucking Ptolemy's most conniving piece of shit family ever. 47 BC, Caesar and his men prepare to battle the Egyptian forces of Ptolemy and Arsinoe. The Egyptians initially have a navy twice the size of the visiting Romans. So initially they'd have the advantage. Caesar controls the palace and a lighthouse in the east, but Achilles and the Egyptian army dominate the rest of the city. And with it, nearly every advantageous position outside the palace. The Egyptians are initially favored to win. Fortunately for, uh, fortunately for Caesar and Cleopatra, a large army of Roman reinforcements hurry towards Alexandria. Mainly from Judea, a Judean general arrives... Uh, Judea, I guess is how you suppose it. A Judean general arrives with a contingent of 3,000 well-armed Jewish fighters. They, con they converge in a fierce battle west of the Nile uh, at a location halfway between Alexandria and present-day Cairo. The casualties are great on both sides. Caesar manages a swift victory and survives. Young Ptolemy does not. He dies at some point during the ensuing fighting. Two Cleopatra siblings are now down. Two more to go. Achilles and other high-ranking Egyptian military and court members also die. Arsinoe is placed in Roman custody and Cleopatra is placed back on the throne. Ugh. So now she is able to reign supreme more securely than she had done uh, you know, four years previously. More securely than any Ptolemy in several generations had ruled. To satisfy the people's preference for a ruling couple and possibly so Caesar could win favor with the Egyptian people, Cleopatra's 12-year-old brother, Ptolemy XIV, now ascends to the throne. He and Cleopatra uh, are, are wed soon after the Alexandrian surrender. Like all of history's great rulers, Cleopatra has now been married to two separate siblings. That's how you do it. You want power, you don't marry a sibling. You marry two of them. You marry one, get that one killed, marry another, and then all the power is yours. Ptolemy XIV uh, assumed the same title that had been used by his dead brother, uh, but he doesn't seem to have had the same ambition to rule. His older sister, Berenice, now his older brother, Ptolemy, have both died over family power squabbles. His sister, Arsinoe, is about to be shipped off to Rome as a prisoner of war. His co-regent Cleopatra, now the lover of who is likely the most powerful man in the world, Julius Caesar. So, you know, uh, initially he knows his place is to just kind of shut the fuck up to stay alive. Uh, he, he would, yeah. The post-war festivities would certainly have included a lavish victory uh, procession through Alexandria, Cleopatra, back on top. Cleopatra needed to unite her people to assert her political supremacy, cement her claim over her detractors. Caesar wanted her to do so for his political ambitions. A stable Egypt, critical to his plans. Uh, Egypt produced way more grain than it consumed. Cleopatra ruling a stagial Egypt could single-handedly feed Rome and make him look great. Right? Uh, Roman citizens love more than anything else to have enough food to be alive. Uh, together they were quite the power couple. June 26, 46 BC, uh, BCE, Caesar leaves Egypt for Rome. Far later than he should have because Rome is in turmoil. To protect Cleopatra, 12,000 of uh, uh, legionnaires who had followed Caesar remain in Egypt. Then two weeks after Caesar departs, Cleopatra goes into labor, gives birth to his son, a uh, son who become known as uh, Caesarian, or Little Caesar. Formerly, his name was Ptolemy, Philo Ptolemy the 15th Philopator. Father, uh, oh, sorry, it's even longer than that. Ptolemy the 15th Philopator, Philomitor. Father lover, mother lover. They're going to try and throw both those titles on him. And then, of course, Caesar at the end. <laughs> they just they just tried killing their family so much they're like well maybe if we name him father lover maybe if we name him mother lover they'll stop killing everybody 
Uh, mothership cemented Cleopatra's reign further. The Egyptian court and people and priests loved a male offspring, right, to carry on the dynasty, some continuity. And so she ruled Egypt alone while Caesar returned to Rome. And early into her new period of rule, Egypt's economy stabilizes. The grain harvests are plentiful. Life is good in Egypt again. Young Cleopatra becomes fantastically wealthy. As ruler, she was privileged to keep, check this out, half of the wealth that Egypt produced. How insane is that? She got to keep half of Egypt's money. That's like, that's like the president getting to keep half of what America produces, or like half of the taxes. In 2017, the American federal government took in $3.3 trillion in tax revenue. Can you imagine if a U.S. president just threw $1.65 trillion into his personal savings account in just a year, right? After that, just, thanks, fuckers. Good luck fixing schools and potholes now. Uh, have fun working two jobs to barely scrape by. And now that you don't even have a uh, police to help you keep the shit you can afford, y you probably won't have that for very much longer. We, we can't pay for law enforcement on half a budget. Uh, best of luck. Uh, I'm going to bounce out to Egypt. I'm going to rule from there. Uh, maybe Greece. Uh, I'm going to kick everyone out, bring over all the world's best scientists, work on a giant space station for me and some of my family and rich friends to live on when my terms are over. Uh, or my term is over and the, and the country's in flames and ruins. Uh, they're going to figure out how to make all of us immortal. It's going to be sweet. I think a four-year total salary is around $6 trillion. Should buy me all the space shit and uh, immortality I need. Man, it's just, it's just a unfathomable amount of money. Historians estimate Cleopatra's annual cash revenue was probably between 12,000 and 15,000 silver talents, which in today's value, between $181 million, $227 million uh, worth of silver a year, just going to Cleopatra in her court. Not, not a bad check. Uh, to really put it in perspective in terms of buying power in the day in relation to other jobs at the time, priests made 15 talents a year. That was a coveted position. Pirates once put a ransom of 20 talents on young Julius Caesar's head. A half-talent fine was crushing to the average peasant. Like, you're done if you got to pay back half a talent. One talent paid for the most lavish of lavish funerals. So with this money, Cleopatra could afford to staff a powerful army to rule her land with and be a powerful asset to Caesar. In late 46 BCE, Cleopatra heads to Rome to meet Caesar. This is the second time Cleopatra has now been to Rome, right? Once as a young child to stay with Pompey when she fleed there with her dad, now to go stay with Caesar while she's in charge. It was a nearly 2,000 kilometer, over 1,200 mile journey across the Mediterranean, traveling northwest. You're constantly fighting the wind. Uh, it took a long time to get there. Uh, according to most historians, in the first century BCE, Rome and Alexandria were the two biggest cities in the world. On 46 BCE, Rome had likely just surpassed Alexandria in population, both cities home to nearly a million people each. Uh, many of us have heard the uh, tales of the ancient splendors of Rome, but Alexandria, equally wondrous. Alexandria had this 90-foot wide avenue that would leave visitors in awe, like this main street. It's scale unmatched in the ancient world. You could lose a day exploring the city from end to end. This, uh, this big avenue lined with uh, delicately carved columns, silk awnings, and richly painted facades. It was the Canopic Way. It could accommodate eight chariots driving abreast. The city's primary side streets were nearly 20 feet wide each, paved with stones, expertly drained, partially lit at night. I mean, think about this way back before the time of Christ. All this stuff is, is like this grandiose and, and modern almost. From east to west, the city measured nearly four miles. It was a wonderland of baths, theaters, gymnasiums, courts, temples, shrines, synagogues, a swelling, uh, you know, just a bunch of uh, music, chaos, and color. It was a mood-altering city of extreme sensuality and high intellectualism. It was like the, like the Paris of the ancient world. According to one historian, it was a place to go to spend your fortune, write your poetry, find or forget a romance, restore your health, and reinvent yourself. So impressive to me that uh, all this existed so, so long ago. On his return from Alexandria, Caesar began to institute a number of reforms drawn from his Egyptian stay. He went to work on the Roman calendar, uh, which by 46 BCE had crept three months ahead of the season. For some time, uh, a Roman year had consisted of 355 days, to which the authorities added an extra month randomly to suit their uh, you know, purposes and try and catch it up. Caesar adopted the Egyptian calendar of 12 30-day months with an additional five-day period at the end of the year, subsequently deemed the only intelligent calendar which had existed in human history. He adopted as well the 12-hour division between night and day that he had known in Alexandria. That's pretty cool. Our AM, PM comes from this. He also installed a gold life-size statue of Cleopatra beside a statue of Venus in Rome, the goddess from which he claimed descent and to whom he ascribed his victories. Dude knew how to woo a queen. 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Cleopatra returned to Alexandria after a short stay to attend royal affairs, then bounced back to Rome a few months later in uh, 45 BCE. 45 BC, Caesar and his, his men also finished off the last of those loyal to his former rival Pompey to control Rome. Uh, the civil war was, Caesar announced, finally over. He settled in Rome for it was to be his longest un uninterrupted stay there in 14 years. He had defeated Pompey. He had defeated the Senate. He was bringing the Republic to an end. One man would now again rule Rome for the first time in centuries, for the first time since Roman monarchs. Uh, but back when it had a king, it was just a small city-state. Now it's a vast empire, the most powerful one in the world. In February of 44 BCE, Caesar is named dictator for life. That's, that's kind of like the best job you can get. In the scale of jobs, what has the most job security? Je it actually turned out it didn't for him. But you would think in theory, dictator for life would. Uh, he, he was dictator for life. It's just his lifespan got much, much shorter after that declaration. Uh, his image was to grace Roman coins, which was a first for a living Roman. And then he went a little mad with power, became obsessed with, uh, with conquering more land than Alexander the Great. Caesar planned to clear Rome's way to India. Alexander tried, didn't quite pull it off. Uh, he was 55 years old, intent on a mission that would consume at least three years. The one that, you know, Alexander the Great, uh, he wasn't Roman, he was Greek by the way, uh, had nearly succeeded at, you know, at doing. Uh, he sent 16 legions and a sizable cavalry uh, ahead to Parthia, announcing a departure date of March 18th. And Cleopatra is in Rome for all of this. Man, that, that would, uh, it would suck to be the husband of, of one of Cleopatra's girlfriends, right? No matter what you do, you just can't compete with Caesar. Right? You ever, have you ever done that? You ever had like, uh, like your, you know, your your girl's friend, dude, just be like at a different level than you are, and then you get to hear like, well, you know what happened with so and so today? He flew her out to Hawaii. It was fucking good for so and so. You know, just hi, baby, brought you some flowers. Oh, thank you, Gallus. Uh, funny, Cleopatra was just talking about flowers. Caesar brought some flowers uh, for for her in from Gaul. It's one of the many places that he conquered that he's supreme a supreme ruler of. Oh, well, good, uh, good for Caesar. Uh, did he bring her a jade bust of his beauty? <laughs> like the one I have for you in the garden? I've secretly had a sculptor working on it for months. No, he, he didn't. He didn't have a jade garden sculpture built. He had a life-size golden sculpture made by the best sculptor in the world. Had a place near the Temple of Venus in the city center for everyone to see. Had a place next to the goddess Venus herself. Ah, oh, well, uh, good for fucking him. Good for that son of a bitch. Uh, you know what we need? We need a vacation. How about we head to Paris, just get away from Rome, get away from Caesar. That's a great idea. You know, I'll ask Cleopatra to ask Caesar where, where he should stay. Because uh, he knows a lot about Paris since he conquered that city on behalf of Rome. The empire he rules single-handedly. Uh, so March 15th, 44 BCE, three days before he is set to attempt to conquer India and all the lands around it, Caesar calls a meeting with the Senate that doesn't go well for him. Uh, all rise as Caesar enters, the dictator for life, the laurel wreath on his head. Mm, I'm Caesar, fucking things are good for me. It's about 11 o'clock, he settles into his new golden chair. Mm, ah, just sitting on a golden chair, waiting to have sex with the queen of Egypt. Things are good. Uh, and then he's speaking, and according to historians, his petitioner interrupts him mid-sentence, reaches out, yanks on his toga. Uh, yanks his toga roughly from his shoulder. It's the signal. It's the predetermined signal. Uh, then this group closes, closes in on him of senators, you know, bearing daggers. He twists away from the initial knife, which only grazes him, finds himself powerless against the, the rain of knife blows that follow. Every conspirator had agreed to participate in the attack uh, to stab wildly at Caesar, and they're doing it. They're stabbing wildly at his face, his thighs, his chest, and occasionally at one another. Damn it. Not good for the heroine of today's tale. Much of Cleopatra's power lies in her alliance with Caesar, he put her back in power, and now, a month after becoming the sole leader of Rome, dictator for life, he's dead. He gets stabbed to death. March 17th, Caesar's will is unsealed, read aloud at Mark Antony's home. People got to be on pins and needles, including Cleopatra. Like, oh, good, please, please have willed Rome to me. Uh, Mark Antony is one of Caesar's most trusted and loyal generals, consul in Rome. Antony uh, had been physically prevented from entering the Senate the day Caesar was killed to protect him. Although Cleopatra had been in Rome in mid-September when Caesar composed his will, she was not named in the will. Gah! It's got a sting. Yep, yep, he left the, uh, the villa and the grounds on which Cleopatra was living to the people of Rome. He bequeathed 75 drachmas to every adult Roman male in the city. He actually could not legally bequeath money to a foreigner, and, and he did not, which is weird. I mean, he's not, he doesn't have a problem bending the rules, but he doesn't bend this one. And he also makes no mention of, of him and Cleopatra's son, Caesarian. 
in, in a move that startled everyone, he also uh, makes no provisions to Mark Antony, one of his closest confidants. Instead, Caesar names Gaius Octavian, his 18-year-old grandnephew, as his heir. People were expecting Mark Antony to be named as the heir. Uh, Caesar had formally adopted this, this guy uh, and granted him three-fourths of his fortune and more valuably, more valuably his name. Antony is appointed Octavian's guardian. That's a shitty consolation prize. Hey, I know you were expecting to be named the man, but guess what? Even better. You get to be protector of the man. That's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah. Three days later, the city erupts in riots, and Caesar's funeral turns into a savage hunt for his murderers. Within one month of Caesar's murder, Cleopatra returns to Alexandria. Uh, for the time being, her position as pharaoh of Egypt is safe. All parties agree that none of Caesar's regulations, uh, favors, and gifts were to be revoked, including, you know, giving, you know, restoring her into power. Even Cyprus is secure. Cleopatra is going to remain a friend and ally of Rome. However, a treachery would ensue again, of course, at the hands of her family. Damn Ptolemies. No family has ever loved to plot against, kill, and marry other family members like these. Just power-hungry hungry dirtbags. While in exile in Rome, Arsinoe, Cleopatra's younger sister, who was taken to Rome by soldiers loyal to Caesar, made new friends. Right? She hadn't given up her lust for the Egyptian throne. After being paraded around Rome in a victory parade for Caesar, she was then sent to be held captive in the temple of Artemis in the Greek city of uh, Ephesus. And in Ephesus, Arsinoe marshals enough support to have herself proclaimed queen of Egypt and freed. Right? They don't quit, these Ptolemies. It makes sense now that you just had to kill them. Uh, it's believed that Arsinoe conspired with her younger brother, Cleopatra's co-regent, Ptolemy XIV, to have Cleopatra killed. Whether she actually did or not, Cleopatra now has the 15-year-old brother killed allegedly by poison. Arsinoe's life is spared for the moment because she doesn't have the clout in, uh, in Ephesus to have her killed there. If you're keeping track of Cleopatra's immediate family members and their treachery, uh, we don't know what happened to her mom. A lot of people think she was killed. Uh, you know, based on the history of her, of her family, probably murdered. Her dad wasn't murdered, but did have his daughter, Cleopatra's older sister, Berenice, the fourth killed. In order to take the throne back from her, Cleopatra's younger brother, Ptolemy XIII, died in a battle with Caesar because he resisted sharing the throne with Cleopatra. Now Cleopatra has her only... Uh, uh, older brother told me that the uh, or only other brother, excuse me, told me the fourteenth killed uh, because he tries to kill her or because uh, he was in her way. So five kids, three now dead due to fighting over the throne, and the remaining two siblings want to kill each other. Whew. Uh, the murder of Ptolemy the fourteenth allows Cleopatra to, pro to proclaim her son Caesarion as her co-regent, uh, which she does this summer. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't seem that they marry each other. Uh, at some point after July, a newly uh, upon, uh, eponymous month uh, that occurred in 14, four, uh, excuse me, occurred in 44 BCE for the first time, Caesarion is named Pharaoh. Caesarion became King Ptolemy, who is as well Caesar, father-loving, mother-loving God is his whole name. I like how they threw in there, uh, who is as well Caesar. Let's, let's not forget that. He should be ruling Rome. Uh, however, because she could realistically um, dream, um, however, excuse me, before she could realistically dream of her son taking over the world, she has to take care of her own kingdom first. Shit is now falling apart in Egypt. So much drama in this story. Such a roller coaster. An unlikely, uh, uh, unlikely and untimely drought hits the North African desert. Uh, the Nile did not stir over the spring of 43 BCE. That summer, it fails to rise at all. It would prove equally uncooperative the following year. Crops fail to a, a degree that defied historical record. No bueno. Cleopatra's people are starving. She has little choice but to open the royal granaries, distribute free wheat. Uh, the timing is particularly terrible as the Roman Civil War is, is uh, you know, is returning violently to Egyptian shores in 43 BCE. Uh, that's a bitch. She inherits the throne, gets exiled by her little brother husband. Then Rome falls into civil war, risks her life to sneak back into Alexandria to talk to Caesar uh, to get him to put her back on the throne. It works. She not only gets put back on the throne, her rival brother is killed. Another rival sibling, her sister, is banished. She also has Caesar's baby, marries another brother, travels with Caesar to Rome, sees him named emperor. Then he gets killed. She has to flee back to Egypt. She then has her remaining sister try to kill her. Then she kills her remaining brother husband. Now her sister waits for her throne in Greece while her people starve in Egypt. And now more Romans head to Egypt, forcing her to form a new alliance or risk Rome, uh, either taking Egypt for itself or dethroning her. How did I ever think history was boring? Uh, this shit makes hardcore porn seem tame. 
All this happens in just 12 years. Crazy. And Cleopatra's life is about to get even more complicated. And we're going to dig into the next big block of her life right after this next sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by another beloved sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an online streaming service that gives in-depth information on a huge variety of different topics, so much knowledge, so much to be sucked. Learn about virtually anything you're interested in with thousands of lectures to explore across history, human behavior, science, travel, cooking, so much more. All the information is reliable and fact-based. Not easy to find that on the web, uh, which I can testify to after doing this podcast for a while now. There are nine courses, 50 different lectures on Egypt alone. So much info to dive into if you like today's topic. Uh, there's a lecture on Cleopatra and a course not even on Egypt, a course on the ancient Greeks. So really even more Egypt than those 50 different Egyptian lectures. Uh, Professor J. Rufus Fears. How great is his name, Professor Fears? Harvard-educated former professor of the classics at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he passed away recently, but he, but he was uh, then. Uh, he, he gives a 30-minute breakdown of Cleopatra's life. If you want to know exactly how to pronounce all the craziest names from today's tales, listen to this dude. If he says a name that sounds a little different than one of the names I've said, I think you should probably go with him every time. Uh, the Great Courses Plus will enrich your life, and as a time sucker, you can sample it for free with unlimited access to learn about anything. Start your free trial now only at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Link, of course, in the episode description. And, of course, you can just push that Great Courses Plus button in the sponsor section of the Time Suck app. Now on to the next big chapter of Cleopatra's life. In Rome, in 43 BCE, Octavian, Mark Antony, Marcus, Aemilius, Lepidus. They formed the second uh, ugh, triumvirate. I think I got it. Each man was elected to a five-year term to co-rule and restore order to the Republic and bring Caesar's assassins to justice, men who'd gone into hiding. A Roman senator and general, Gaius Cassius uh, Longinus. Sounds like one of those names I made up earlier. Longinus Pinacus, no. This is uh, Gaius Cassius Longinus, one of Caesar's assassins, reaches out to Cleopatra for military aid. The battle for Rome is on. Another general, former ally of Pompey, when Pompey battled Caesar for Rome, who then became an ally of Caesar, also reaches out to Cleopatra for aid. Now Cleopatra has to decide who to align herself with. Pretty important choice. Who has the best chance of taking Rome? Who, if they take Rome, are the least interested in having her and her son killed? since they may fear that her son will make a claim as, uh, uh, to Rome as Caesar's heir. So she tells Cassius that due to the drought, she can't help him. Ah, duh, bummer. Uh, she tells him she didn't appreciate him murdering the father of her children, that she'd, uh, she'd like him to make a formal apology. And then he does, and then the two of them wed. And then Cleopatra bears Cassius three sons. No, that doesn't happen. Balls, balls on that guy, though, for asking her for help. Hey, uh, Cleopatra, I listen, I know that the last time we spoke, it was... It was just before I plotted against and then killed your baby daddy. But, you know, shit's crazy. Uh, I mean, you're told me. Uh, you fucking get it. You know? You're probably, uh, you, you probably would have killed him anyway. Hell, hell, you're probably eating one of your own babies right now. You, you told him he's a loony as shit. Anywho, can I have some soldiers? I need soldiers. I need to take Rome and shit. You know, I gotta, I gotta lead it. Or, you know, or I'm gonna be dead. Because uh, that's what they do. If I don't lead it, they're gonna want me dead and shit. So, you know, TTYL. -T -T uh, can you imagine if that's how ancient people actually spoke? Uh, if they just were as crass and informal with language as many of us are now. Yo, Cleo! Like they're translating that. Uh, here's the uh, translation. Yo, Cleo! What the fuck's going on with you and shit in Egypt? Bet it's hot as fuck. Shit. All sandy and shit. I couldn't do it. I ain't fucking with those crocs, you know? Ha! Nah, playa. So, uh, just give me some soldiers and shit, you feel me? Uh, Cleopatra does offer to give aid to Publius Cornelius Dolabella a man Mark Antony put in charge of the province of Syria, a man allied with Mark Antony, and therefore a man who is an enemy of Cassius. She sent the four legions previously left to her by Caesar to guard her uh, to, to now aid Dolabella. And then unfortunately, those troops are captured by Cassius in Palestine. Damn it. And then Cleopatra's governor in Cyprus, uh, Serapion, defects to Cassius and provides him with ships traitor. That, that's exactly why I have never trusted a guy by the name of Serapion. I've known, you know, I've known, if I had a nickel for every Serapian I've met where I'm like, ah, I don't trust him. His sketchy name, it just seems sketchy. Uh, so yes, this guy uh, is a traitor, turns on him, provides Cassius with ships, not good. Ties are turning in favor of the man who had uh, had her man killed, you know. Um, I struggle in, in, in with what to call Caesar in relation to Cleopatra. Lover? Baby daddy? The two were never married in the eyes of Rome. 
they were together, but, uh, you know, I, I, they did seem to have some sort of Egyptian wedding ceremony, even though Cleopatra was technically married to her brother, so they could, they could co-rule. Ah, these people led the most complicated lives. Anyway, shit is not going well for, for Cleopatra. Looking like she's picked the wrong horse to win the race, especially when Cassius' uh, army encircles Dolabella and his remaining troops in July of 43 BCE, and he commits suicide. Tough break when the horse you bet on kills itself. That's, that's not good in a horse race. We're like, man, what happened to the horse race? Uh, how, how'd the horse race go for you? You're bit, ah, my, my horse killed itself halfway through the race. Ah, that sucks. Uh, sucks, especially if you've bet a good chunk of your fortune and your, and your future on this horse. Cleopatra now takes her own fleet to Greece to personally assist. Lead some, lead some ships out there. Personally assist Octavian and Anthony in their combined fight against Cassius, but her ships get heavily damaged in a Mediterranean storm, and she arrives too late to aid in the fighting. Dang it. Luckily... Uh, despite Cleopatra being unable to help Mark Antony and Caesar's adopted son Octavian win their war anyway. By the autumn of 42 BC, Antony had defeated the forces of Caesar's assassins at the Battle of Philippi, uh, a battle in Greece that an estimated 200,000 men fought in, uh, or Philippi, uh, leading to the suicide of Cassius and Brutus. Et tu, Brute? That Brutus. Uh, later in Dante's 14th century Italian epic poem, Dante's Inferno, the first part of his Divine Comedy, Brutus is one of the three people deemed sinful enough to be chewed in one of the three mouths of Satan in the very center of hell for all eternity. The other two are Cassius, uh, who is Brutus' fellow co-conspirator uh, you know, we just talked about, and Judas is, uh, is Cariot, uh, betrayer of Jesus. So Dante didn't like these guys. Dante condemned these three in the afterlife for being treacherous to their master. So legendary traitors. In the summer of 41 BCE, Cleopatra and Antony meet after the war, uh, she's got some explaining to do. She needs to make sure that her lack of productive assistance against Cassius didn't, doesn't get interpreted as you know her having backed Cassius, because that doesn't look good. Anthony now controls the East for Rome. Egypt falls under his scope of influence. He's the most important Roman Cleopatra uh, can talk to. Anthony is a younger man than Caesar was when she met Caesar. Anthony is 42, curly-haired, square-jawed, broad-shouldered, all muscled up, all jacked. She decides to wow him with the grand entrance and a uh, hell of a first impression after he continually requests her presence. Anthony had installed himself in Tarsus, this flourishing administrative capital of uh, Cilicia, near the southeastern coast of modern Turkey. Cleopatra, this is how she introduces, himself to, to, uh, introduces herself to him. This is an in, uh, incredible first impression. She floats up a bright crystalline river into Tarsus on a barge with gilded stern and soaring purple sails she reclines beneath a golden spangled canopy dressed as Venus in a painting. Young boys looking like painted cupids stand at her sides and fan her. Her fairest maidens are dressed as sea nymphs, some steering at the rudder, some working at the ropes. Wondrous odors uh, from countless incense offerings diffusing themselves along the riverbanks. She floats into Tarsus like something out of a dream. Anthony gapes at the extraordinary display. Cleopatra smiles modestly, apologizes for such a modest entrance. Ah, sorry. Sorry it's not so grandiose. I had to do this quickly. I had to find a few sea nymphs in a hurry and some cupids. I'll try harder next time. Uh, she tells him that she, uh, she brought them some, some wedding gifts for him, which were everything he was looking at. Uh, invites him to come and dine with her uh, the next day, along with his friends and commanders. After that meal, she uh, sends her guests. Sorry if you heard a little bark. Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell are in the suck dungeon, and they need to shut the fuck up. Um, sorry, the dogs. Dogs are running loose near the near the recording studio today. But she, she yeah, she tells him you know she brings all these gifts. He can have everything. They have this nice dinner. Uh, tells the tells the guests and everything they've admired at the dinner. They take with them. She gives them everything, including the couches. Anthony returns uh, for another meal a few days later. He arrives to a knee deep, knee deep expanse of roses. The whole display serves a very specific purpose for Cleopatra. It says, uh, you should be my ally because look around. I have a lot of fucking money. So much money. So many talents. I have so many talents. I could help you. She, she also knows that because of uh, years of civil war, uh, the Roman coffers are virtually empty. She knows that they, they need money. Mark Antony uh, was also a party boy and she knew the pure extravagant fun of everything she was doing would appeal greatly to him. You know, what other hostess in the world could show him this decadent of a good time? On his way uh, to Tarsus, Anthony had been hailed, as Cleopatra knew, as the new Dionysius. Dionysus, there we go, god of wine, fertility, theater, and more in ancient Greek religion and myth. The party god, he was a party boy. 
So her display works. One historian said her effect on Anthony was immediate and electrifying. She had seduced a second incredibly powerful Roman man. Impressive for a woman back then, especially impressive for a woman who is not a Roman citizen. Because usually the Roman leaders stayed within uh, uh, their own kind of circles for, for dating. Cleopatra stayed a few weeks, accomplished a great deal. She'd re-secured her throne for the time being. By the time she sailed home, Antony had in his hand a list of demands from Cleopatra, one of which was killing her last surviving sibling. Ptolemies, they love to kill their siblings. Antony ordered uh, Arsinoe to be forcibly removed from the temple of Artemis, and she was killed on the temple's marble steps before the ornate ivory doors that her father had once donated to this place years earlier. Now Cleopatra has no remaining kin to put to death. Her, her immediate uh, bloodline, uh, they're gone. Antony also has the traitorous, traitorous governor of Cyprus put to death, and she is fully restored to power th there as well. Uh, a short time later, Mark Antony travels to Egypt, staying at a, as a guest of Cleopatra's. He visits Alexandria's golden temples, frequents, uh, frequents their gymnasiums, uh, attends scholarly discussions, parties his ass off. Just a dude on top of the world, enjoying the splendors of a foreign kingdom, having sex with their queen, knowing he could conquer their land if he, if he wanted to. God, he's got to feel good about himself when he wakes up in the morning. I am the greatest man alive! It's another day for me. Uh, in April of 40 BCE, Antony leaves Egypt for Syria to prepare for battle against the Parthenians, a major and long-standing Iranian empire. He also receives a letter from his wife, Fulvia. Oops, did I mention he was already married? Uh, Fulvia was, was worried uh, that her life and the lives of uh, their two sons were in danger in Greece, and she had reason to be worried. The drama continues. While Antony was busy getting busy with Cleopatra, his ally against Cassius, adopted son of Caesar, uh, Octavian had returned to Rome to dispense land to Caesar's veterans. Uh, Octavian was married to Fulvia's daughter, uh, Clodia, from a marriage previous to Mark Antony. Um, and, and, and now Octavian had divorced Clodia, which is an insult to Mark Antony. He divorces Mark Antony's stepdaughter. And he also accuses Fulvia a, a, of aiming at supreme power for herself and Antony. So now Octavian is feuding with Antony's wife. Shit is getting tense between the two most powerful men in Rome. The tension is not good for Cleopatra, who could get brought down via some collateral damage if shit goes real sour between the two. Fulvia now fears that Octavian is spending too much time gaining veterans' loyalty, turning his men against Antony and her family. Uh, afraid for her life, she flees to Greece. Fulvia then allies with her brother-in-law, Lucius Antonius, Mark Antony's brother, publicly endorses her husband to rule alone without Octavian. Shit's getting serious. So in 40 BCE, Antony sails for Rome to deal with this new rivalry with his previous ally, Octavian. Shortly after he leaves, Fulvia gets sick and dies. And this ends up being actually pr pretty good news for Anthony. Not, not that he was like running around, just, you know, you know his ship, just high-fiving his soldiers, just, Woo! She's dead! Ha <laughs> ha! My Roman wife is dead! Now I can focus on my Egyptian wife! Uh, no. It, it, but this works out in favor of, uh, for Anthony because when he arrives in Rome, it's easier for him and Octavian to patch things up. Uh, you know, it was Fulvia's daughter that Octavian divorced, not Antony's. And now as a sign of peace, Octavian gives his sister Octavia, not real creative with names, these people, to Antony to wed. Had he still been married to Fulvia, he could not under Roman law, uh, you know, marry Octavia. So this is good for Antony politically, but this is also terrible for Cleopatra. Not only is, is, is Antony her man, but Octavian is by birthright her mortal enemy. Octavian stands in the way of her son's claim, Caesar's biological son's claim on Rome, and now this is her dude's brother-in-law. Shit is just getting more complicated. It's such an ancient soap opera. At the end of 40 BCE, Cleopatra gives birth to twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra uh, Selene, the second, a.k.a. Cleopatra uh, the eighth. In ancient Greek, the last names mean sun and moon. When Mark, uh, they are Mark Anthony's twins, and she gives birth to them while he is off marrying Octavia, or on the verge of marrying Octavia. When Octavia finds out, she's thrilled. Of course she's thrilled. She loves kids. She thinks it would be fun. Now, not to only raise the kids Anthony had previously with Fulvia, but uh, also, you know, if helps needed, raise the kids Anthony is having uh, currently with another uh, another wife, Cleopatra. Uh, Octavia is not Anthony's second wife, by the way. She was his fourth, and this is not counting Cleopatra, and he'd had kids with each of his wives, uh, an unknown amount of kids with the first one. Dude loved getting it on. He actually built several temples to Lucifina, the ancient Greek and then Egyptian goddess of sexuality, love, mischief, and also sometimes of power and female independence. Hail Lucifina! 
a goddess who is sexual yet transcends sexuality, the great seductress. Cleopatra worshiped Lucifina, as did many Ptolemies before her. It's where Cleopatra got her sexual powers. It's also why her family ended up both fucking and killing each other so very often. Because here's the thing about Cleopatra, to, uh, excuse me, here's the thing about Lucifina. Too much Lucifina worship can lead to hedonistic mayhem and anarchy. Too much carpe diem, not enough planning for the months and years ahead. It's not practical to go full Lucifina all the time. However, too little Lucifina can lead to an existence so boring and devoid of any real passion and irreverent fun that you die without ever really having lived at all. So complicated, this Lucifina. So hard for me to wrap my male mind around sometime. And of course, I'm departing from history when I speak of Lucifina. Uh, she's a god in my world, in the time suck world, not Anthony's. And, and, and I was kidding, of course, about Octavia being thrilled <laughs> about Anthony's discretions. I'm guessing his relationship with Cleopatra was something that him and Octavia, you know, didn't spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, history doesn't say. In the spring of 38 BCE, Anthony and Octavia have a daughter, Antonia Minor. Dude loved making babies. Uh, there's a good chance that all of us are probably related to Mark Anthony. Uh, he loved brothels too. And it's not like contraception was reliable back then, so who knows how many kids. He might have had a Genghis Khan level of kids. Uh, Anthony also heads to Syria to stage his delayed war with the Parthenians. Octavia and his new daughter accompany him. Octavia is actually pregnant with another... <laughs> this guy is very fertile. Octavia is pregnant with another daughter. He worries about Octavia's health traveling when pregnant and has them stay in a mansion of his in Athens when they get to Greece and not continue to travel with him. The, the safety of his family may have been part of his motivation to leave his family behind. The rest of it uh, was so he could do more fucking. He wants to see Cleopatra again. Probably wouldn't hate seeing his son and daughter as well back in Alexandria, his other kids. Anthony would actually never see Octavia and, and, uh, and his kids with her again. Anthony sails on, reunites with Cleopatra in Antioch, uh, then a city, in, or, ah, I didn't write a pronunciation for that one. Whatever, it's A-N-T-I-O-C-H. Pronounce as you will. Uh, then a city in Syria, now a city in Turkey. Not long after they arrived, coins are circulated, bearing the portraits of Anthony on one side, Cleopatra on the other. <clears throat> Anthony sees the twins he's had with Cleopatra for the first time, who are now three years old, and apparently has no problem uh, with leaving one family behind to visit a new one. Uh, he was allegedly fond of the saying, noble families were extended by the successive begettings of many kings. I told you you love making babies. This is his very noble and proper way of saying, look, I'm a desired powerful man. I'm a fuck who I'm going to fuck. Uh, I don't think Lindsay would be cool with me having that outlook. Hey, babe, listen, here's the deal. I'm yours when I'm here. But when I hit the road, time to spread that seed. Uh, <laughs> that would... Of course, of course, actually, that would not work for me because you could just come back uh, in a variety of ways because you could come back with, uh, yeah, you're sterile. Uh, you've had a vasectomy. All you're going to be spreading are some STDs. You're going to be picking up from your road horse. Uh, okay. So September 37 BCE, not only had Anthony returned to Cleopatra, he, he came bearing big gifts. Uh, he expanded her kingdom in September of 37 BC. He gives her a well-wooded part of today's Lebanon, a lush far-off uh, uh, part of today's Libya, a generous swath of cedar, heavy uh, uh, part of today's Turkey, portions of the island of Crete, all but two cities of the thriving Phoenician coast. In several cases, Antony eliminates uh, reigning kings and queens to give all this to Cleopatra. He's clearly very into her. He, he actually does seem to really have loved Cleopatra. Uh, you know, as a guy who frankly could get just about any woman he wanted, he, you know, he would have he would have never fallen in love with someone you know, who wasn't powerful like she was, but he does seem to have really cared about her as opposed to just being like a, a, a military ally. You know, Caesar is, uh, also cared for Cleopatra, but I don't think he cared for her like Antony did. Caesar knew that he was stronger, more capable of conquering Rome with Cleopatra, and all the silver talents and wheats, you know, she could supply his army, I, I feel like were maybe his main motivation. His lack of mentioning her in his will, I think, speaks of her importance to him. And, and yes, as we said, it was not, you know, Roman custom to leave your fortune to a foreigner, but... You know, it's not like Caesar uh, minded breaking Roman customs. Antony spent enough time around Caesar to know how valuable militarily Cleopatra was to him. Uh, so, you know, he, he may have been lovesick, like I'm saying, but um, again, he also wouldn't have allowed himself to fall in love with somebody that couldn't, I'm sure, help him in some way. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Anyway, by the fall of 37 BC, Cleopatra rules over nearly the entire eastern Mediterranean coast, from what is today eastern Libya in Africa, north through Israel, Lebanon, and Syria, to southern Turkey, uh, excepting only slivers of Judea. She had nearly returned the Ptolemaic Empire to the height of its third century glory. 
Mark Antony took her empire to even greater heights than Caesar did. Also, in late 37 BCE, many historians believe that Mark Antony and Cleopatra got married. Although their marriage would not have been recognized by Rome, since Antony was still married to Octavia, a woman <laughs> who was not only raising their kids, but also raising the kids he previously had with Fulvia. And remember Octo Octavia, the sister of the man Antony was ruling Rome with, a man he'd uh, already almost clashed with Octavia. So he's, he's been pretty reckless with his romance with Cleopatra. Uh, he, he had to have known on some level that all of this is going to push him eventually towards war with Octavian. Uh, another war for the sole throne of, of Rome. By early 36 BCE, Cleopatra is pregnant again, uh, carrying Antony's child, another son, Ptolemy Philadelphus. Ptolemy, the brother-loving, is born in the fall of 36 BCE. Antony, while Cleopatra was pregnant, had finally set off to fight for Parthia, and it was going horribly. He was low on rations, funds, and morale. Cleopatra came to the rescue with money, clothes, and I'm guessing hot desert sex with Antony, a lover of Dionysus. His, his other wife, Octavia, also tries to come to his rescue. Of course she does. I'm sure she's not happy about Cleopatra, but she also knows that if her husband is defeated in battle, she's the widow of a beaten man, and her stock, uh, social stock is greatly lowered in Rome. Uh, or, or who knows, maybe she really, you know, did love this rascal. He was apparently a real charmer. Octavia asks her brother, Octavian, for permission to aid Antony, and he grants it. Octavian's own campaigns have been going well the past few years. He has the necessary men. With his sister, he sends an elite corps of 2,000 hand-picked armored bodyguards to help Antony, kind of. He makes it look like he's helping Antony, but really, he is fucking him over. The previous year, Octavian had promised Antony 20,000 men for Parthia, which he never delivered. For Antony to now accept these 2,000 men is to forfeit the 18,000 men at a time when he desperately needs more men to replenish his ranks. Octavia's trip essentially is an ambush. To decline her help is to insult his rival sister. To accept is to accept less men than he needs for his campaign. There's no good choice Antony can make. Octavia knows this. Out of loyalty to Cleopatra, Antony denies his wife Octavia's kind of false help. She had already set out on the trip by the time she got the news, and now she, uh, she finds out she's not wanted, returns to Rome, a powerful woman scorned. That's not good. Antony uh, has now rejected Octavia and essentially rejected Octavian with her. In 36 BCE, without Octavia or Octavian's help, Antony and his men take the kingdom of Armenia, a land that Parthians had taken decades earlier. A substantial victory against uh, the, the Parthians. He declares the kingdom a Roman province, he celebrates in true lavish Roman over-the-top style. Uh, <laughs> he has the previously ruling family bound in chains of gold. In the open court of the royal complex, he discovers a silver platform on which two massive golden thrones sit. Mark Antony occupies one, addressing her as the new Isis, new goddess. He invites Cleopatra to join him on the other. She appears in the full regalia of the goddess Isis. You know, this uh, pleated, lustrously striped, you know, uh, outfit its fringed edge reaching her ankles. By one account, Antony uh, dressed as Dionysus in a gold embroidered gown and high Greek boots. By his command, Cleopatra was henceforth to be known as the Queen of Kings. On coins minted for the occasion, she becomes the first foreigner to appear on a Roman coin. This has to be a huge insult to Octavia. She has to find out about this. Her brother has to find out about this. After the victory, Antony does not return to Rome. He stays with Cleopatra, which sends Octavian a strong message of, go fuck yourself. We don't need you for our eastern expansion plans. We'll do this without you. Things are, are, are going super well for Cleopatra now. So she's, uh, she's able to supply her husband with all he needs for war. Uh, the drought's been long over, or over long enough, for her kingdom to, to again amass tremendous wealth. She supplies 200 of Antony's 500 warships, fully manned, along with 20,000 talents. All the supplies required to sustain a vast army, in his case, 75,000 legionnaires, 25,000 infantry, 12,000 cavalry for the duration of a war. And things are going well for a time, uh, things go, continue to go well for a time for Cleopatra and Antony. They raise their kids, enjoy ruling over a vast land, probably have a, a bunch of crazy sex, you know, enjoy being super duper, obscenely rich. And then in late 32 BCE, Octavian declares war on 51-year-old Antony and 37-year-old Cleopatra. Surprised it took that long, but shit moved a lot slower. In the age before phones, uh, ships with you know engines, or even the Pony Express, they have mail. Uh, before this declaration, many of Antony's allies, at least a third of the Senate, uh, the Roman Senate, argued that Antony should leave Cleopatra, return to Rome to rule with Octavian. Initially, Antony did consider this, but Cleopatra argued that she'd fed his troops, 
She provided his fleet. She was as capable to him as any man. He didn't need them. She'd earned his loyalty. Anthony ends up agreeing. He chooses to stay with her. Bold fucking move. Octavian is a powerful, powerful Roman general uh, who now has, you know, full support of the Senate, support of uh, most of Rome's soldiers. Anthony is placing a lot of faith in the support of Cleopatra. In April of 32 BC, Anthony and Cleopatra sail with Anthony's staff to the island of Samos off the coast of modern-day Turkey, staying in a residence. Uh, Anthony formerly shared with Octavia. And then in May, he divorces Octavia. He showers Cleopatra with gifts. In the summer of 32 BC, he, gave, he gives Cleopatra the library of uh, Pergamum, an ancient library that rivaled uh, the library of Alexandria as far as the great libraries of the ancient world. Back in Rome, Octavian conducts a smear campaign against Antony, warns the uh, Senate that Antony had become a slave to his love for Cleopatra. The Egyptian queen had subdued Antony. Rome, Octavian warned, would be next to fall to Egyptians, uh, to uh, Cleopatra's Egyptian charm. All right, be, be gone, Lucifina. At the end of October, he declares war on Antony and Cleopatra. The Senate strips Antony of his consulship and relieves him of all authority. Antony and Cleopatra are now the main enemies of Rome. In early 31 BC, Octavian's superb naval admiral, Agrippa, uh, made a swift su uh, surprise crossing to Greece and disrupts Antony's supply lines and captures his southern base. And then a stalemate ensues. Octavian could not lure Antony out to sea where Agrippa would crush him. Antony could not coax Octavian onto, onto a land battle where he could perhaps crush him. After 16 weeks of the blockade, Antony's supplies are running low. He doesn't have the manpower to power his men uh, over land all the way into Rome. Uh, if he waits much longer, his men are going to starve. So what does he do? He decides to sneak out uh, at night across the water. Late in the evening of September 1st, Cleopatra's officers secretly load her chest of treasure onto her ship, and Antony loads up 20,000 soldiers with them, thousands of archers and slingers, Around sunrise, Octavian's men look on in amazement as Cleopatra speeds south in her majestic flagship. And then they say Antony transferred from his flagship to a swift galley, follows behind her with 40 ships of his personal squadron. Antony and Cleopatra had slipped away with a third of the remaining fleet and all of her treasure. Antony then heads to Libya, where he has posted four legions so he can rally up a few more troops. He just left most of his troops behind. Uh, Cleopatra heads to Alexandria. Uh, they had escaped, but Octavian had now won. Bittersweet victory, right? They'd left 19 legions of men and 12,000 cavalry behind who, after a week of negotiations, surrender to Octavian and become part of his army. Antony is alive, but now is without an army big enough to fight Octavian. He was, as the historian Plutarch so cleverly wrote, Motherfuckaticus... <laughs> couldn't do it. Motherfuckaticus Bigtimacus. Just because I laughed doesn't mean it's not true. He was, Plutarch wrote... Motherfuckedicus, big timeicus, he was a cus, shit a cus, out of a cus, luck a cus. Of course, that's not true. That was harder to say than I thought it would be. I don't, I don't know why I had confidence in being able to say that. <laughs> Antony rendezvoused with Cleopatra and uh, Alexandria after getting his troops in Libya. They, they both send Octavian uh, letters now. Letters that are basically like, ha, hey, ha, ha, sorry, <laughs> sorry about stuff. Uh, now they ask him to kind of, like, can we attempt to reach some kind of resolution that doesn't include you coming to Egypt and killing us? Octavian does not re reply to the initial letters. Anthony begs to be allowed to just live out the rest of his days as an Egyptian citizen, never to return to Rome in another letter. Octavian doesn't reply to that. Uh, he then offers up his life if Octavian will spare Cleopatra's life. No dice. Octavian's not uh, agreeing to any terms. Cleopatra sends letters. Cleopatra asks if she and Anthony... Uh, both have to die. Can she at least pass her kingdom on down to her kids? Nope. Uh, Cleopatra, as Octavian gets closer, even sends uh, you know him and his troops a golden scepter, crown, and throne. She offers to step down as ruler if he will just let her and her family live. He finally replies, Okay, I'll do that on one condition. You have to arrange for Anthony's execution or at least exile him. She refuses. I think she really did love this dude. She refuses, and then Octavian prepares to conquer Egypt. Cleopatra enjoys the next few months, knowing they may be her last. Uh, they celebrate Cleopatra's 38th birthday, Anthony's 53rd. I bet they drank a lot of wine on those birthdays. Can you drink away the knowledge that the most powerful military uh, leader in the world is now coming to kill you? Uh, as Octavian advances on Alexandria, Anthony decides at the last second to go, to go out fighting. He rallies a modest force. It's pretty badass. He rallies a modest force, rides out to meet Octavian's much larger advance guard in the outskirts of the city, several miles east of the famed Canopic Gate. Octavian's army, depleted from the march, 
uh, incredibly get their asses kicked. Anthony's cavalry does win the day. They rout Octavian's men. Exalted by his victory, Anthony returns to the palace, kisses Cleopatra, and presents to her one of the soldiers who had fought well that day. For his courage, Cleopatra rewards this dusty young man with a golden breastplate and helmet. With respect and gratitude, he accepts. And then, that night, he defects to Octavian. Damn it! Anthony is undaunted by this, though. He knows he can still win. He knows. Uh, sure, Octavian has many, many more men than he does. Sure, more of his men are defecting to Octavian's side by the minute. But he has found a new god. He has found a new god who will for sure lead him to victory. Anthony had found solace and guidance that night and none other than Nimrod! Hail Nimrod! Luckily, there was a Nimrod altar in Alexandria. Nimrod, the ancient god of time suck, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, and beyond, the great and mighty hunter, the ancient lord of battle, lord of knowledge, master of the Anunnaki. Nimrod, the giant space sasquatch the size of an entire galaxy with the head of a chubacabra. He who rides the black unicorn with flaming suns for eyes, he of the great alpha and omega ball sack, he of the flaming butthole of hell. Anthony finds a cocker spaniel that ancient, very Egyptian dog, and smashes its skull at the altar of Nimrod to pay tribute, which I should mention is not necessarily how you're supposed to worship Nimrod now. Some theologians think that the old stomp the skulls of Cocker Spaniels every month to show loyalty to Nimrod was actually a metaphor. Uh, they believe it was never meant to be taken literally. It's just meant to illustrate the point of sacrificing ignorance. Cocker Spaniels, not known to be very smart dogs. Both my dogs have a little cocker in them, and I'm pretty sure that's where all the Penny and Ginger's dumb comes from. Some believe Cocker Spaniels represent ignorance, right? In this kind of allegory, this is metaphor. Uh, the Cocker Spaniels represent ignorance in Nimrod mythology, and by stomping out the, the ignorance, you're thereby worshiping and paying tribute to Nimrod. That's how I interpret it. Others, however, the literalists, they, they do actually stomp the Cocker Spaniels, which is unfortunate, and I'm pretty sure very illegal. Uh, from what I can tell, from what I've gathered, I don't think you can buy a Cocker Spaniel smashing permit anywhere, even if it's for religion. At least not where I found online. Uh, anyway, for, uh, forget about Cocker Spaniels. The important thing is to, rem uh, is to remember that none of this has anything to do with today's story. None of this has anything to do with Roman or Egyptian history. Sometimes the world of the suck again bleeds a little over into the real world of history. Anthony had no idea who Nimrod was. Sorry, new listener. I know this. a lot of this stuff's been confusing. Don't worry, I'm back on track now. Because I'm back on track! ba no no uh, Anthony didn't know who Nimrod was. He did, he, uh, he didn't, and he didn't have faith in defeating Octavian. He knew he was fucked. He knows. He's a, he's a smart military guy. He knows he's not going to win. Cleopatra also knows not going to win. Uh, she flees to her mausoleum, sends a messenger to Anthony with a report of her death. Perhaps she thought this news would cause Anthony to take his own life, and then maybe Octavian would spare hers. Uh, we're not actually sure why she did it this way. When Anthony heard that Cleopatra had taken her life, he decides to take his own. Historian Plutarch writes that he said, O oh, Cleopatra, I am not distressed to have lost you, for I shall straightway join you. But I am grieved that a commander as great as I should be found to be inferior to a woman in courage. By pre-arrangement, his servant Eros was designated to kill him should, uh, you know, in this situation. Reminds me of the samurai, suck, you know. Uh, that samurai kind of ritual suicide of uh, seppuku. Uh, Anthony now requests Eros to kill him. Eros draws his sword and then turns from his master and slays himself instead. Damn it. Right action, wrong dude. A wrong body, dude. Now you can't fix this. Ah. Eros claps on Anthony's feet. Anthony then takes his own sword. The blade, which would have been about two and a half feet long, extended steel point, runs it straight into his ribs, misses his heart, punctures his abdomen. Man, that would hurt. He wounds himself severely, but doesn't do enough damage to kill himself quickly. He begs those around him to finish him off, but his immediate attendants have left him. Cleopatra hears what Anthony has done, sends her servants to find him. They find some of his soldiers, and then those soldiers carry him, bleeding to death in agony, to the mausoleum. Cleopatra hauls Anthony up, lays him out on the couch. She rips and tears at her robes, wailing with grief. Anthony dies in her arms. It's a bloody, disgusting, sad sight. While some of their relationship was built on power, a lot was built on love. I, I really think that the love of Cleopatra's life had just died violently in her arms. The man who pushed him to take his life is now coming for her. Octavian reaches the mausoleum around August 1st, tries to talk Cleopatra out of killing herself. It's better for his return to Rome if he brings her back alive so he can parade her around the city in defeat. That will bring him more glory than her death. While negotiating with Cleopatra, two of Octavian's men are able to sneak inside the mausoleum and barely stop her from killing herself with a little dagger. Octavian then gives Cleopatra permission to bury Anthony herself. She and her two female attendants do it. 
This is just sadness stacked upon more sadness for Cleopatra now. It's all over. Her love is dead. Her kingdom is gone. She knows that the lives of her and her children are in grave danger. On the return to the mausoleum, after burying Antony, she orders a bath to be prepared. She is still allowed this luxury. She reclines at a table, enjoys her a meal she knows will be her last. She actually uh, she ordered a chicken fillet number one, simple, lightly fried chicken, a couple slices of pickle, buttery buns, some waffle fries with a bit of ketchup, and then some sweet tea and some lemonade. Just a little bit of an Arnold Palmer. Uh, Palmer. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know what she had. I just. I, I just know that that sounds good to me right now because I haven't had carbs for weeks. Uh, okay. Anyway, shortly after she was done eating. A servant appeared uh, outside her doors with a basket of figs direct from the countryside. She gives the man guarding her, one of Octavian's advisors, a note for Octavian. He briefly leaves her side to deliver it. Octavian reads Cleopatra's request that Cleopatra be buried at Anthony's side, and immediately he knows what she's done. Damn it. He dispatches messengers to try and reach her before it's too late. It is too late. They find uh, Cleopatra laying on a golden couch, probably an Egyptian-style bed with lion paws for legs, a, li a lion heads at its corners, majestically and meticulously arrayed, uh, and displayed in her most beautiful apparel. She, she grips in her hands that crook and, and flail, those very Egyptian symbols you see on the tombs of those pharaohs, uh, the symbols of the pharaohs. She, she goes out like a true Egyptian queen. In August, on, uh, it's August 12th, 30 BCE, and the last pharaoh to rule Egypt is dead. She's perfectly composed, completely dead. Octavian calls in a Libyan believed to enjoy some magical immunity to snake venom. Uh, by taste, they were said to be able to determine what kind of snake had bitten Cleopatra. And the prevalent rumor is that an asp uh, snuck in that basket of figs. But poison was, was a more likely alternative. Most likely, she swallowed a lethal drink. Maybe, maybe hemlock and opium of Socrates would have done the trick. Or applied some kind of toxic ointment they had back then. Cleopatra's, uh, Cleopatra's oldest son, Caesarian son of Caesar, escapes and, got, and gets as far away as a, as a port on the Red Sea. But then he decides to return to Alexandria, possibly to try and negotiate with Octavian to spare his life. It doesn't happen. Octavian's men murder him in Alexandria, possibly having tortured him first. Uh, as they pose no real danger, Cleopatra and Anthony's children, Alexander Helios, Cleopatra uh, Salini, and Ptolemy Philadelphus, return to Rome with Octavian to be raised by his always amenable sister. She's just raising everybody's kids now. It's just Anthony's kids from so many different people. Octavian obliterated all traces of Anthony in both uh, Rome and Alexandria then. And then Octavian returns to Rome, a city in disarray after years of civil wars. By 27 BCE, he will re-Christian himself as Augustus. Augustus I, first emperor of the Roman Empire. The, Rome, uh, the Roman Empire will endure in the West after that until 40, 476 CE which will mark the beginning of Europe's Dark Ages, and it will endure in the East until 1453 CE, falling at last to the Ottoman Empire. And that takes us out of one hell of a time-suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. I feel like I just ran a marathon. It's quite a life, right? Before we recap it, here, here's a couple more random facts about Cleopatra. Cleopatra could speak at least seven languages, some say nine. She was very well educated, including Greek and Egyptian. Her brain was more important than her beauty, which, which uh, may have not been that noteworthy. Plutarch wrote, her beauty, as we are told, was in itself neither altogether incomparable, nor such as to strike those who saw her. Rather, it was the whole package. Her wit, her charm, and again, according to Plutarch, the sweetness and the tones of her voice that made her so irresistible. She was a charmer. Intelligence is sexy. Confidence is sexy. You don't have to be born looking like some Victoria's Secret runway model to be sexy as hell. Mm -mm. Confident, intelligent, hail Lucifina. In addition to being the first uh, Ptolemaic pharaoh to learn the Egyptian language, she was also the first to worship Egyptian gods instead of Greek gods. She claimed to be the reincarnation of the Egyptian god Isis. She was in many ways the most Egyptian pharaoh the Egyptians had had in three centuries. We, uh, we know Mark Antony loved to party, so did Cleopatra. Uh, at least when she was with him in the winter of 4140 BCE, uh, early in their romance, living a life of leisure and excess in Egypt, the two actually formed their own drinking society, like a drinking club, known as the uh, Inimitable Livers. <laughs> the unsurpassed, unable to be copied drinkers. This, uh, this group engaged in nightly feasts and wine binges, and its members occasionally took part in elaborate games and contests. And apparently one of Anthony and Cleopatra's favorite activities was wandering the streets of Alexandria in disguise and playing pranks on its residents. That is so funny to me. Imagine the kind of pranks you could get away with uh, <laughs> if you were queen of Egypt and you know, and basically like you know, one of one of the two most powerful men in Rome. Oh man, that would, that would, that would suck for the people you're playing pranks against. Please help! 
This miscreant have pushed me down the stairs. My arm is broken. Uh, miscreants? No, it is I, Mark Antony, son of Rome. <laughs> please, noble Antony, please do not hurt me further. Before you pushed me down the stairs, I was fleeing a terrible woman who'd thrown snakes upon me in the alley, threatened to burn me alive if she caught me. That's no terrible woman. It is your queen, Cleopatra. This is all a royal joke. But my arm is really broken. Stop crying, peasant. You're ruining our mirth and merriment. Uh, cry again, and your neck will soon be broken as well. Take your, take your bent arm and get out of here. Uh, the name Cleopatra, here's something else, uh, in ancient Greek means she who comes from a glorious father, fucking Ptolemy, had all his male descendants named after him, and then most of his female descendants named in honor of him. The egos on these ancient rulers. Should have done that with uh, my kids. This is my son, Daniel. And this is my daughter, she who loves her father, Daniel. Uh, crazy how long the Egyptian Empire lasted before it fell to Octavian. Uh, the Great Pyramids at Giza were constructed between 2550 and two, uh, 2490 geez, BCE. Two and a half millennia before Cleopatra. That means that Cleopatra lived closer to the time of the moon landing than she did to the construction of the pyramids. And yes, I do believe in the moon landing. Uh, okay, also... Romans and Egyptians were both exceptionally hedonistic in their, in their, you know, uh, in the time of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Probably not a big surprise. Romans are known for being, you know, very sexually decadent. In 33 BCE, during an opening of the year celebration in Alexandria, kind of a type of New Year's Eve party, uh, a huge mass orgy was held in Cleopatra's palace. There were over 300 rumored to have attended. Cleopatra and Antony uh, both have uh, rumored to have participated. At one point during the party, the crowd gathered around a masked woman having sex with a male baboon. <laughs> uh, even crazier, a masked man allegedly had sex with a female cheetah that I'm guessing had to have been tranquilized somehow. I don't think, I don't think a non-tranquilized cheetah is letting some dude fuck it. Uh, but to be fair, I don't know a whole lot about the sexual desires of cheetahs. Uh, then things got even crazier. For the grand finale, another woman performed the Devil's Triangle with two camels. When the deed was done... This brought Anthony to his feet. He had been, he had been sitting in Washington town. He brought him to his feet, wildly clapping and cheering, and he allegedly yelled out, once more, in Latin. And over the years, that has been translated into the modern encore. So that's kind of crazy, right? The origin of a band or other performer coming out to sing one more song, perform, you know, whatever uh, they're performing one more time. If you trace it all the way back, it actually originates to, to when two camels fucked an Egyptian woman in the presence of Mark Anthony. Anyone. Did anyone bite on that? Did anyone at all believe that? Please, <laughs> please tell me that some of you were like, get out, really? So when we yell encore, we're really, in a way, yelling for two camels to fuck a lady. God, history is so strange. History is strange. It is strange, but it's not quite that strange. That was nonsense, but fun for me. Let's, let's get back to truth with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Cleopatra was born in 69 BCE, died on August 12th, 30 BCE at the age of 39. She was a member of the Greek-speaking, family-fucking, family-murdering, crazy-as-shit Ptolemaic uh, dynasty who ruled in some form in Egypt from 332 BCE to 30 BCE. Number two, Cleopatra's first great love, father of her first uh, child, Julius Caesar. The statesman and general Julius Caesar lived from 100 to 44 BC, expanded the Roman Republic through a series of battles across Europe before declaring himself dictator for life. Died famously on the steps of the Senate at the hands of political rivals. Gaius Julius Caesar, often remembered as one of the great military minds, uh, one of the greatest in history, and credited with laying the foundation for the Roman Empire. We should give him his own suck someday. He, he's a side character in today's tale, but so much more to his life. Number three, the second great love and real love of Cleopatra's life, Mark Antony. The Roman politician and general, uh, the child creator and party boy, Mark Antony, 83 BCE to 30 BC, was an ally and trusted friend of Julius Caesar. Then he became the main rival to Caesar's successor and Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, later Emperor Augustus of the Roman Empire. He played an integral role in Rome's transition from republic to empire. Uh, he may have been, uh, you know, or had he, may have, had he been a little more militarily minded, maybe a little less focused on party in Egypt, maybe, just maybe, he and Cleopatra could have ruled Rome and Egypt together. Number four, technically Cleopatra was not the last pharaoh of Egypt. Since he outlived her by a few days, her son Ptolemy the 15th, Ptolemy uh, Philopator, uh, Philomator, fuck these names, uh, Caesar, 
uh, better known as Caesarian. He died on August 23rd at the age of 17. He outlived his mother by just two weeks. In 34 BC, Antony had granted further eastern lands and titles to Caesarian and to his own three children along with Cleopatra. Caesarian was proclaimed to be a god, son of a god, king of kings. The grandiose title was unprecedented in the management of Roman client king uh, relationships and you know, could be seen as threatening to the greatness of the Roman people. Antony also declared Caesarian to be Caesar's uh, true son and heir, direct threat to Octavian, whose claim to power was based on his status as Julius Caesar's grandnephew and adopted son. Uh, and that pro proclamation also probably partly caused the fatal breach in Antony's relations with Octavian, who used Roman resentment over the land and all these titles, you know, he's given to Cleopatra and Cleopatra's uh, kids as a way to gain support for his war against Antony and Cleopatra. Real quick, number five, short one, new info. The tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Antony has never been found. Though the Egyptian Antiquity Service believes it to be in or near uh, the temple of uh, Topo, uh, Cyrus Magna, no pronunciation existed for that that I could find, uh, southwest of Alexandria. Archaeologists continue to search for their tomb to this day, so go out there and find it. Go out there and find it and you'll be awarded with many talents. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Cleopatra has been sucked. I uh, probably butchered some of those pronunciations, but it wasn't due to lack of effort. Uh, a for effort. If I didn't get A for execution, I really enjoyed that suck. Loving history more and more as the suck goes forward. Hope you are too. Uh, I am looking forward, though, to this next week when the words are easy. Whew. Ah, let's focus on words. More on, more on story, which is kind of weird to say. Um, anyway, thank you to the Time Suck team. As always, Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, doing more and more work on all things suck all the time. High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Camp. Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Doctor Joe Motherfucking Paisley, uh, Time Slug High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, uh, Danger Brain doing some sick new logo design for the the uh, upcoming podcast will be launching sometime later this year, and uh, a, a logo design for a new network logo they're all going to fall under. I'm very excited by what I've seen. Thanks to uh, Space Wizards and Merch Wizards Access Apparel, uh, also designing awesome shit for the store. Time Slug Baby Onesie looks so cool. Never thought that would happen when I started all this. Uh, thanks to Knowledge Ninja Heather Rylander for kicking off the Cleopatra suck. Great job. Love it. Um, have you given the cult of the curious private Facebook group a try yet? No? Well, then get the fuck in there. There are uh, now over 6,000 time suckers in the private cult of the curious uh, group on Facebook. Very, very interactive, very engaged. More have liked our Time Suck Facebook page or the Time Suck Instagram profile. You want even more interaction? Time Suck's Discord channel. Getting, getting wild. Lots of awesome sub channels. Over uh, 1,000 Discord members now linked to the Discord chat room messaging app right in the Time Suck app. Link to the private Facebook group and to the Discord channel in today's episode description. Whew! Are you guys ready for uh, another serial killer? Uh, I am. Is that is that weird to say? I am ready for a proper serial killer suck. It is coming for your ass this next Monday. Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, born on December 18th, 1948 in Burbank, California. Edmund Kemper, at age 15, killed both his grandparents. Uh, killed his grandparents. Killed his grandma to, quote, see what it felt like. Uh, yeah. Not because they were molesting him. Not because they were terrible, terrible people. They weren't. Just offed grandma and pappy because he was just curious how it would feel. And apparently, he liked it. A few years later, after a ridiculously short period of incarceration, where he was able to uh, manipulate some psychiatrist at a state mental hospital to get released real soon, uh, he started thinking that fucking with hitchhikers would be fun. And then he thought, you know, it would be more fun than just kind of, you know, picking up hitchhikers all the time? Killing them. And then he remembered how much fun killing his family was. Uh, so much uh, family killing in the suck right now. He kills uh, he's some more family. It, are you curious about Ed Kemper? I hope so. I am. It, it's uh, doing doing the initial research already. I, I can't remember the last suck. Maybe the toy box killer was the last time I had so many like, what the fuck? Like out loud, just sitting at my desk. Like, are you kidding me? Um, so suck that with me uh, on Monday. Time now for today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. All right, great B D B. Uh, great, great B, great B D B, great B D B Cooper B, great D B Cooper update to start off the time sucker updates today. Love new info. This comes in from time sucker Dustin Crawford. Dustin writes, "Hey, master sucker, you beautiful bastard. I've got an update for the D B Cooper suck, and I think you'll find this to be pretty interesting. I was watching a show about the skyjacking a couple years back, and they brought up something pretty weird." Some people think that he may have been of French or French-Canadian heritage, or that he was a soldier who spent some time in Europe. Why? Apparently, there was a precedent for a dude named Dan Cooper jumping out of airplanes. 
a Franco-Belgian comic book called Dan Cooper. It was published in 1954. Yeah, it was called Dan Cooper. Ran until 2010. Uh, the cover issue of issue number seven, which came out back when it was published by Lombard between 1957 and 1979, shows a dude jumping out of a plane. Uh, a man named Dan Cooper is plastered across the top of the comic. Yeah, that name Dan Cooper is on the top of the... Apparently, the FBI even followed up on this potential lead. It's pretty weird shit. Uh, it could very well be a coincidence, and it could be the human brain trying to make connections where there aren't any, but it's a pretty goddamn specific co coincidence. I don't know what to make of it, but I'll include a link for you so you can look at the cover and draw your own conclusions. Love the episode, and I look forward to next week, the week after that, the week after that, and so on until the sun burns out of the fucking sky. Keep on sucking, you, you got among men. Thanks, Dustin Crawford. Well, that's, you're too nice. You're too nice, Dustin. Hail Nimrod. Uh, thank you very much. I checked out the links, and that is a weird coincidence for sure. Uh, whoever did it had to have known about this comic book. It's crazy. It says Dan Cooper's name, just plastered, big, big font right across the front of that issue. Uh, I've included the link in the episode notes, which are all, always available uh, on the TimeSuck app or the TimeSuck website. It's easy to download those notes. You can go to the uh, my notes for the show, go down to the updates, and click if you want to uh, check out this this website, or I mean this comic book. Thank you, Dustin. I hope you are well. Uh, next one uh, is a little update about the cult of the curious taking care of one of its own. Dan the Suckmaster, Joe R.D. Paisley, the Queen, Penny Pooper, Ginger Bell, Kyler, and Monroe, uh, what has been built in the cult of the curious is something truly special. I knew it was something like I'd never been a part of, but I didn't know its actual depth until I needed to call on them. This month, my wife and I had trouble making ends meet for rent. I just started a new job and am building my caseload as a private practice pediatric speech therapist. I get paid per billable unit, so that means I only get paid when I'm, acti when I'm actively treating a kiddo. Well, the way the paychecks fall... And my, and, my late, and my low caseload made this month's rent impossible to pay. My wife and I had no idea what to do. I don't have close enough friends to ask, neither does she. Both of our families wouldn't be able to help, so I turned to the cult. I posted a story and a GoFundMe to the Facebook group trying to raise $1,200 for rent as of Sunday night. It's an 880, all from cult members. I am blown away, absolutely humbled. Uh, I talked about how embarrassing this was to ask for help like this, and the response I got was incredible. All comments of good wishes and, uh, to not, and, and to not be embarrassed. If there was ever any doubt what kind of family this is, this doubt should be shattered for anyone. The cult of the curious and time suck is truly something special. You created this, Dan, because you give a damn. You should be very proud. Thanks for all you do. Thanks to cult for what they are. Hail Nimrod. Jason. P.S. I'm linking the GoFundMe just in case this gets read and, uh, and can be linked. I feel like a right cunt for asking and posting. I just can't get over it. So, again, in the, in the uh, episode notes on the app of the website, in the time circle, you can, you can find this GoFundMe link. Uh, last I checked, I think it was almost full. It might be full now, but you can check. That's, that's awesome. Uh, I, I'm so happy for you, man. So happy uh, you were able to kind of lean on us uh, and get that and, 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 and lean on you know, the other listeners. That's, it's, it's amazing what you guys do. You guys, you guys just make this community uh, very special by, by helping each other out. It's, it's crazy. I, I've also never been a part of something like that. It's really, really amazing. Uh, okay. Focusing on the right things in life message coming in from Eric. I'll leave out his last name just in case he doesn't want this somewhat sensitive information out there for everyone to know his business. He writes, hey, Dan, I just want to send you a message to say thank you. My wife and I are both space lizards and your words really uh, hit home for us tonight. I just got some real shitty news from my mortgage company. I thought I set up automatic payments back in November and apparently I fucked it up somewhere. Now I'm $4,800 behind. That sounds exactly like something I would do. I almost threw up when I read the letter. It's all my fault. By far, my stupidity uh, fucked that up. I dreaded more than anything telling my wife how bad I fucked up. She's had real bad luck with work lately, lost a job in the job market for what she does, pretty much tanked at the same time. She had to take a part-time job making less money. After a lot of tears from me, she reminded me of the same thing your last few episodes have been about. We got so much to be thankful for. We have a healthy nine-year-old boy, our family and friends. We decided we don't know how, but everything is going to work out. We will figure something out. And as long as we focus on the great things in our lives, everything else is just details. Thank you for those perfectly timed inspirational episodes. They are really helping me right now, more than I could ever tell you. Just thank you, man, from the bottom of my slightly crushed uh, heart right now. Your words echoed through my space lizard wife. Your words echoed through my space lizard wife's are really saving me from a dark place right now. I'm not super religious, but I do believe in God. And man, you are in the right place doing the right thing. Keep fighting the good fight against willful influence. Uh, yeah, like negative influence. And keep making the, the world a better place. I'm, I, I'm guessing you meant willfully uh, ignorant influence. Yes. You're humble and sometimes fucking stupid space, Eric. Really, guys, thank you for being that escape everyone needs in a force for good. Oh, man. Oh, you will. Yeah, we all fuck up, man. We all fuck up. And yeah, 
Usually, if you uh, if you put you down, your, your nose to the grindstone and just focus on, you know, like we're going to power ahead and we're going to just figure it out and we're not going to give up, then usually it works out. You know, I, I would say uh, I would say almost always. I don't have stats for that, but I, but I feel that to be true. And uh, I'm glad I'm glad that uh, that helped you out, gave you a little inspiration. We I, I need that. I, I needed the, to research that stuff to remind myself. All right, we got a we got a word choice update now. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is word choice update is uh, is oh man, this coming in from uh, dang it, uh, I didn't write the name of this one, so sorry. Oh man, hopefully the name. Uh, Word Choice Update says, Hey, suck brother, BDM here and soon to be space. There's ones I can catch up on content. You're incredibly talented. Can't wait to, uh, to drunk say it to your face and on the BDM cruise. Anyway, wanted to know if anyone else noticed your use of disorientated instead of disoriented. Same goes for oriented. Technically, it's totally correct. It just always throws me off. The extra syllable sounds silly to me. Kind of like saying conversating instead of conversing. Yep. Apparently, it's the British form of the word which uh, would answer why I haven't heard this uh, you know, much before. I was going to throw some jokes your way, but the boss lady walked in and, and, and I got to not get fired. Hail the Shebeast, Josh. Okay, Josh. At least I know Josh, you're a BDM and Space Lizard. Uh, thanks, man. Excited for that Tom and Dan cruise. I am excited for that cruise. Get my passport renewed for it uh, March 7th to the 11th out of Port Canaveral, Florida. Uh, I think it's almost sold out. More tickets at TomAndDanCruise.com. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I hate that I say it the way I do as well. I, I really do have a little bit of some kind of like, I don't know, it's like a weird redneck dialect. I think I've said this before, it's the dialect of someone who probably read more than he talked at certain points in life. Uh, I, d I do think it has a lot to do with where I grew up though, my family. I, I just learned to speak in a bit of a funky way growing up and it's been hard to shake out of my system. So often it's funny, like someone will tell me the correct way to say a word and it just doesn't feel right. Like I don't like it, I'm like, nah, ah, sounds, I know it's proper sounding, but I don't like it. it. Makes me feel pretentious, which I know is crazy, but it's how I feel. Uh, no one should model their speech patterns after me. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you with one last DBQ. Uh, D what the fuck am I saying? DBQ? I'll leave you with one last DB Cooper update. This comes in from Sucker and A Play. A ah. Goodbye, guys. What if I just hit the button? Ah, fuck it. I'm out. My mouth's not working. No, this ki this comes in if I can get the sentence right. If not, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna punch my way out of this room. Uh, this comes in from Sucker and A Plus Meet Sack Michelle McHenry. Uh, she says, hey, it's Michelle from New Jersey again. I just finished the DB Cooper suck and I'm astonished, baffled even, that you didn't even reference the 2004 classic without a paddle. The entire movie, three friends, Matthew Lillard, Dax Shepard, and Seth Green are searching for DB Cooper's treasure. DB is played by none other than the late great Burt Reynolds. Uh, be it the movie doesn't go very far into the lore behind DB's mysterious getaway, but I do love me some Matthew Lillard. I'm really not surprised you didn't mention the movie. I just finally had the urge to send in a message, LOL. Anywho, this is getting long, so I'll stop. Hail Nimrod, praise Bojangles, rock sign. <laughs> uh, thanks, Michelle. Yes, for, the, for you Cooper fans, check out this movie. I have not seen it. Uh, I did see it pop up in articles as a movie that references D.B. Cooper. I uh, didn't realize the actual plot of the film is about finding D.B. Cooper's treasure. And, and also, uh, talking about the actors there, uh, who doesn't like Dax Shepard and Seth Green? Oh, Dax Shepard and Idiocracy? Seth Green with Robot Chicken? Mwah! Beautiful. Uh, thanks everyone. That is all of the updates for today. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. All right, time suckers. So try not to kill, fuck, or marry any family members this week. Uh, it's no longer legal uh, or any kind of social norm anywhere. Focus instead on just continuing to keep on sucking. <laughs> oh, sucking.